Hey, you there, Milo here. Welcome back to another progress video. I made another hat. This is uh, to commemorate all of the Unity folks uh, jumping on the bad wagon. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, family. It's time to get some work done without having a hand up your ass. I call this one, uh, it's good. And it is a, a little, little present to all the folks who constantly correct me on how to pronounce the uh, Godot engine. And um, I'm never going to stop saying Godot. You know why? It's because there's years, literal years of video evidence of me mispronouncing it. It is a hill I'm going to die on. And I'll call that hill Godot. I'll do it. Don't tempt me. Oh, and uh, speaking of the hats, I wanted to make sure I did not forget this. Big shout out and big thanks to the man, the myth, the legend, Bastian Ollie, who has been coronated as the very first customer of my merchandise store. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's been long enough for me to be able to find his, uh, his little Twitter post. Hey, look at this handsome devil. He looks so serious, like he's about to start implementing AR into Godot. In case you're not familiar with this absolute unit of a gentleman, Bastion is headlining the VR and XR development for Godot attention efforts. As a matter of fact, I'm fairly certain the very presence and availability of VR in Godot is pretty much thanks to uh, this gentleman. He's also a very supportive and extremely active member of the Godot community. And I know that fact because I've had some uh, beef with some of the terrain developer folks making their plugins, but then taking away some of the key role features should actually have, like depth mapping and don't take away my roughness map. And while everybody was bickering on how wrong I am, Bastion was pretty much the only person who actually reached out to me and actually took the very precious time out of his day to comprehensively explain the reasons why that might be so and what the motivations are and what might happen in the future. So the sheer amount of effort coming out of this gentleman is absolutely unprecedented. He's an absolute powerhouse of positivity. Thank you very much, man. I really appreciate your support. And uh, that puts me this much closer to winning the bet with my dad. On a completely unrelated note, I've smashed my phone. <laughs> Whoa, that's just fantastic. I think this is the last time I will ever, ever buy a, what is considered to be a premium grade phone. I bought this for the camera. The back camera is all right. The front camera is dog shit. All right, Google likes to uh, to boast about the low, uh, what is it, low lighting shooting. It sucks. It looks like somebody crop dusted radioactive shit all over your image. And the repair has been quoted at $400. I'm never spending more than 150 bucks on a phone ever again. All right, I'm, no, no, no. I can buy two phones for that much. No. I could attempt a uh, self repair, uh, the replacement kit is 170, so maybe, but honestly, I can buy a Pixel A15 for, for that much, so maybe I'll leave that on like the shelf and may maybe when I have some spare cash, I'll attempt it and who knows, maybe I'll film it and see how it goes. So, progress video. I almost made it on a monthly basis. It's only been... You know, something I uh, totally underestimated in uh, in this whole venture of me making embroidery hats is that how much time actually goes into the non-embroidery part of embroidery of the hats. Because I had my progress update video, the previous one, on YouTube, unlisted, waiting to be released for almost an extra month, like 20 days. And that's because I had to set up things like the web store, I had to do all the, the photography for the products, and of course I, I decided to go way over what is necessary and do some 360 shots for the hats. I really attempted to to try to use everything that is available to me to make that process as fast as possible, but it came out like shit. And uh, it, I, I just said, you know what, screw it. As long as I'm doing this, I might as well get myself some lighting hardware, some background fabric, a Lazy Susan.
come back. You're my backdrop. Come on. You're supposed to sell me on this stuff. So yeah, lots of work, lots of work. And only once I had all those things figured out, then I could actually release the video. But the good news is that all those are really one-time expenses. Once it's done, it's done. The shop is set up. And uh, of course, I decided to program the whole thing myself because it's a good experience. We can finally move on with, you know, this, the part that I actually want to be doing. So both of these are going to be on my website, eisenstadtstudio.com. You can find a merchandise link there. And of course, any Gadot merch, 30% of that goes towards the Gadot Foundation. Although they have been... Um, they haven't had a lot of trouble getting funded thanks to Unity shenanigans as of late. Whew. I gotta say, they don't need a PR uh, department. Gadot is like, we'll just sit here, do our thing, and then um, anytime another engine screws up, I guess we'll just get traffic. I mean, there's nothing else we can do. It's like the uh, the Sriracha sauce uh, branding. They don't they, they do no marketing whatsoever because the brand carries itself. It's all word of mouth. It's literally in almost every single family's home. What marketing do you need? Anyways, let's um let's focus on the actual game dev progress. What kind of progress have we made for game dev this month and two months before then? All right, I have vague recollections that I've already might have talked about this, but it's in my uncommented folder, so I guess here we go. Since this is about time when I received my embroidery machine, I wanted to put together a couple of designs that I can, well, embroider and put up on the website and try to start collecting some sort of passive income for supporting this project. I've put together two very quick monochromatic designs of a character doing some fishing and a character in front of a fireplace or a campfire. And oh my god, let me tell you, both of these designs were a royal pain in the ass to try to embroider. There are considerations that I have to make when I'm designing these sort of artworks uh, to account for the fact that this is physical medium and it's thread and needle. There are just certain physical limitations that do not allow me to create certain types of artwork. Like all the teeny tiny little details, tiny crevices, very small stitches, very small details, anything in the foliage, all the ripples in the water, all of that was a huge pain in the ass because I keep experiencing it all. I experienced thread tears, I experienced broken needles, I experienced the thread smoking up the storm. I swear to God, if, if I didn't know better, I thought this company was trying to sneak Snoop Dogg into Canada. Every consecutive design was getting a little bit better, but it was a rough learning curve. I had to learn a whole bunch of stuff about thread direction and then uh, density, thickness, underlays. It was a lot. And frankly, I was kind of disappointed because I did like these compositions, these little artworks. So who knows? Maybe I'll find a different way of bringing that into the uh, merge. Hey, who knows? Maybe I'll cut up some aluminum discs and turn them into coins. Child of Ether is a survival game, and a particular point I wanted to focus on is cooking. We've covered this before, but the combat system in this game is heavily dependent on your stockpile of action points. Now, you can't have infinite action points in your stats, you have to be able to replenish them with very complex, elaborate, well-cooked meals. Some certain select ingredients do give you a little bit of action points that you can uh, kind of replenish it on the go, but you're gonna run out of inventory space very quickly if you're just gonna stockpile in raw ingredients. Instead of having, let's say, wild berries that give you one or two action points, why not cook up, let's say, some sort of a berry pie, which gives you 20 action points, and then you can stock maybe four of those in your inventory. So since cooking is a pretty big deal in this game, I needed to set up some sort of a set of uh, base ingredients, the foundational ingredients you use in cooking just about any meal. The only thing is that I know shit about cooking. I, the most advanced meal that I can cook is chicken fajitas, which is pretty, pretty basic. You know, cook up a little bit of chicken and in the separate pan you cook up, what, peppers, red onions, uh, uh, green peppers, red peppers, and then literally just the rest is the uh, the, the, the fajita seasoning, which comes in pre-made packets. So realistically, most of the flavor is coming from the spices anyways. So with this complete bare-bone, non-existent experience in cooking, I've contacted my best friend Tim, which you should know by now from our mutual gaming channel, Retroactive Gamers. And I have asked him to help me with this task because he has formal chef's experience and education. 
So after a little bit of chat, he gave me a list of all the sort of base ingredient that you will find in a good number of meals. These are pretty basic ingredients like garlic, leek, uh, onion, tomato, salad, carrots, potatoes. Starting with these base ingredients, he says you could pretty much make just about any hearty, well-nourished meal. So off I go to create some sprites for these base items. Now, since I was already on the roll of creating all the cookable raw ingredients, you have to be able to grow those. So I've set out to create the actual plantable crop plants that would yield these resources. Now, the system for actually growing the crops is already in place. All I have to do is populate the dictionary definitions for how many stages each type of crop has and uh, supply the images that need to be displayed on each and every stage. Realistically, because I choose to work with dictionaries and uh, have a single variable which stores all of the, say, growable definitions, I can technically add some modding tools for people to be able to add additional crops. Quite literally, all they have to do is follow the instructions, follow the uh, rules for defining items, and I can just write a piece of code that reads a file that they can include their definitions for custom crops and sprites. I can then take that contents, convert it to a dictionary, append it to the already existing variable containing all the crops, and that's it. New crops have been added to the game. Obviously, I'm no Bethesda, and I can't really create uh, complicated uh, advanced modding tools like the, you know, the GEC, the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, which is basically just a whole separate software engine for editing the maps um, and adding additional item types. But I can try to add at least something. Hypothetically speaking, because I like using dictionaries for a lot of my systems, um, the dialogue, the quest systems, the task and the journal systems, item systems, I can pretty easily add this kind of text-based appension uh, modding tools. But it's just me talking, this is me putting the carriage in front of the horse. As a matter of fact, the horse has tripped down and the carriage killed it in the process. We'll leave any modding talk on the back burner. Some of the crop types do present a bit of a challenge because propagating some of them has to make sense. For example, if you grow beans, it makes sense that you get a beanstalk as a result, but you can then dismantle that beanstalk into multiple individual bean seeds, and then when you plant the bean seed, you get a new plant. Okay, cool. What about carrots? What about cabbage? What about celery? How is the player supposed to propagate those if you pretty much use the entire celery stick in your meal? So for those types of plants that don't technically produce a large seed or something very small, I decided to allow the player to dismantle, let's say, a carrot into the carrot body and a carrot stem. The stem can be planted back into the ground and it will result in a new carrot bunch, which can then break apart into multiple carrots and then split up the carrot bodies and the carrot stems again. Same thing with cabbage and same thing with celery. With cabbage, you simply separate the leaves, which you use for cooking, and what you're left with is the cabbage stem, which can be planted again, and uh, you get a cabbage bunch when it grows up. And this is where multiple growth stages actually come into play. If you plant a cabbage stump or cabbage stem, if you wait long enough, you're gonna get a whole new cabbage. But if you wait even longer, you're gonna get multiple cabbage heads per one plant. When the player plants an ingredient into the soil mount, uh, the plant will uh, record the times at which it will achieve each and every growth stage, which of course, as discussed before, allows it to continue growing even if the player isn't located in the level. And some crops only have one extra growth stage. They simply go from a stem to a fully grown uh, ingredient. Certain other plants have three growth stages where if you wait long enough, it will uh, result in a higher yield. Of course, everything right now is accelerated for the sake of testing, but pretty much every ingredient at this point has a growable counterpart that allows you to acquire it. Now, where's the player supposed to get these ingredients in the first place? Well, for that, I decided that uh, out in the wilderness, there are certain zones where a certain type of crop can be found in the wild. You usually find it in a very small stem format, so you're never really going to find a fully grown cabbage head in the wilderness. But maybe I can make it so that very rarely you'll come across one, but for the most part, what you're going to be finding are stems, little tiny baby versions of those. 
which by themselves cannot be consumed, but you can bring them to your garden and grow the fully fledged cabbages and celeries and yada yada yada. Then I have discovered kind of a big revelation on the inner workings of Godot Engine. Um, you see, I've been experiencing these terrible frame rate drops anytime I open my developer console or developer panel, which essentially is a user interface or inventory interface containing every single item that's currently defined in the item database. For some reason, my frames would just drop down to like 18 frames, 15 frames, and the more items I would add to the item database, the slower the game would become. And what I have discovered is that if you put a lot of logic code into the physics process, it really bogs down the game. You know by now that I approach these sort of systems in a very modular fashion. My inventory is basically one single node, one single scene, which is called the item slot. That item slot is then duplicated 20 or 30 or 50 times for however many slots I want to have in my inventory. Now, the logic in this code is fairly simple. Essentially, in a process, a uh, physics process function, the inventory would check if there is a valid item to display, if it has a, a an icon that it can load up, if there's amount data, or if there's a maximum stack data, if there's maybe some sort of additional information that needs to be displayed, and it would go ahead and display that data on the inventory slot. It would also process things like button presses, uh, left click, right click, checking if you have any modifier keys, uh, like for example pressing alt while clicking on an inventory slot causes you to only pick up one of the stack in that inventory slot or if you hold shift and then you left click you pick up half the stack so a lot of the stuff I borrowed from Minecraft so we're not really talking about very difficult logic code to work with and yet for whatever reason every time I open the developer panel my frames would just go to shit and for an absolutely no reason I decided on a fluke to rename the pro physics process function to a process function and immediately immediately everything was fixed so what i speculate happened is that because i put the code into a physics process uh, the physics process is locked to a maximum of 90 times per second or 90 executions per second 90 frames per second and uh, i think because all of my logic code was running all the time con continuously to constantly check if items have changed if icons have changed if amount has changed so you can update that information um, it was bogging down the physics process and that affected the rest of the game now the reason i put that code into the physics process is because i thought that um, inventory code is not something that needs to run very often right it needs to run i don't know like like once every, maybe a couple of hundred times uh every minute or something right so i figured okay physics process it runs at 90 times per second so it's not going to execute my code as many times so maybe i should put the basic inventory logic into the physics process and what i can only imagine is that maybe the physics process doesn't have as many resources delegated to it to handle uh, multi-depth logic, for example, multi-dimensional logic with multiple conditions nested inside of each other. And it is in fact the regular process function, good old funk process, that is uh, designed to have most of the processing power delegated to it, where you can put all of your logic. At least that's my speculation. I don't know what's happening under the hood. It was my assumption that there's certain types of code that doesn't need to run as often. So, you know, process function will run literally as fast as the processor will let it, and physics process will run at 90 times per second. So, you know, maybe I was wrong in that front. I've spent the rest of the time setting up a generic resource spawner, which is effectively just the zone that uh, makes sure that in this particular radius, there's always gonna be an X amount of this particular resource existing at all times. So this to make sure that the natural world always replenishes its resources and the player is never really gonna run out. I will have to make sure I do not forget to actually place these zones all over the world so that there's a bunch of resources, a bunch of raw ingredients that the player needs to use to cook certain things. There has to be a way for the player to actually acquire them. Now, these are just the raw ingredients. I still have no idea how I'm going to pull off the cooking system, and I want to do something interesting for that. Perhaps something a bit more engaging, like Cook Serve Delicious-esque type deal. So, while I am cooking up the cooking system, pun intended, I figured I'd switch my focus to a little bit of character design. There's a particular side story that's not even an official quest that I had in mind that I wanted to communicate and required a female character. 
it has been a very long time since I've actually made a character for this game, especially one that is requiring the standard multi-plane view approach. I have attempted to create an alternate system where the characters are actually three-dimensional characters, but their body parts are rigged in a ragdoll type of system with armatures and bones, and uh, the player could technically see them from the side, but uh, I could animate them without necessarily doing frame-by-frame -frame animation, and it sucked! It looked like ass! This game gets compared to Don't Starve a lot, and the kind of animations I'm talking about are I would say something like in Don't Starve, which essentially doesn't treat the animations, as far as I can tell, doesn't treat the animations uh, as one single frame by frame image, but instead they have uh, like these uh, spline animations, spline rigs that they use on characters. Now that saves up a lot of time on animation, but I personally wanted to go with frame by frame classical animation. And again, my primary reason is practice. I'd get some practice doing this kind of animation so I can use uh, the skills in other uh, projects. Of course, the challenge here, the, the most tedious part is that this is a 3D game, the character is 2D, which means as the camera rotates around the character, there has to be multiple views. The main character has eight views uh, that the character's run cycle, at least right now, is fully animated in, which means there's eight fully animated run cycles. I mean, they, they look like ass right now, but don't worry, that's just placeholder animations. The main character is gonna be on the screen quite a long time, which it makes sense for the main character to have uh, intricate animations from multiple views. But NPCs, they're really gonna be on the screen for, I don't know, like a few minutes at a time and then the player's off back into the wilderness. So realistically, they don't require eight views. I think four is more than enough. Heck, I think even in Don't Starve, the enemies and the, the creatures, the, the animals, they have only the front view and the back view and they just do a little flip-flop between left and right to get their left and right animations based on their movement direction. Now, in hindsight, drawing the character from the four different planes was easy. Actually getting the character to face those four different planes was not. Something like this requires some vector math, angle calculations, divisions, uh, looking at where the camera is looking at, uh, looking at what the character is looking at, and then interpolating some sort of an angle difference and then dividing it into a range of zones of how many different sides the camera can see the character from. And it all didn't quite work correctly. I have tried getting some help on the uh, the Godot subreddit and the Godot Discord server to see if I can um, have somebody help me out with the formula. I did get an answer. I did get a formula. It worked with a very simple box shape. It did not work with, well, a character. So you know what? I decided to go for the dumbest approach ever and it worked. All I did is place four different labels uh, in the character and I made the parent node of those labels have the same exact angle as the camera of the player. So that as the player camera rotates, the front always looks at the camera, the left always looks to the left, rights to the right and backs back. And then there's a little ball, a little ball in front of the character which determines where is the character looking at. And the code simply checks the distance uh, which one of those four labels is the closest to the ball? If it's the front one, the character is going to be uh, displaying the front sprite. If it's the right one, it's going to display the right sprite. Yes, I would have initially liked to have made the system using nothing but code, but math is not my strongest suit. So I decided to use nodes and it works. I don't expect the, to have like a massive amount of NPCs in one single location, uh, which means you know all of them would have to uh, run this this complex code. Well, complex, woo, calculating distance. You know, I I don't expect there to be multiple NPCs in one space where they all have to run this sort of code. Not that this code is really any complicated. For the most part, when the player is far away from the NPC, their entire rendering gets disabled anyway, so it doesn't matter. So to any anyone who's just getting into Godot or anyone who's just getting into coding, the general consensus that I go by is if it works and it doesn't cause performance issues, it's just as fine of a solution as some programming solution X. Honestly, 
If it works, don't fix it. With programming, there's always more than one solution to a problem, or at least almost always, like 99.9%. .9%. Just in case I'm gonna leave the 0.1% for the, you know, occasional Yo man, what about the X condition, huh? Bet you didn't think of that one, huh? Bitch. Next, I've spent some time battling my goddamn drawing tablet. This is a Huon Canvas 22, and as of the most recent installation of Windows, which took place about two-ish weeks ago, because my uh, game development hard drive has, uh, you know, kicked the bucket, and um, I decided to screw it, I'll just reinstall the whole OS. For some reason, a new problem has surfaced, and it's the fact that um, my tablet, once in a while, ceases to allow me to click on user interface buttons, like menus, file, edit, configuration, script, uh, it doesn't allow me to close uh, the application. I can't even sometimes switch to, say, the task manager and click on the uh, on the application to shut it down because, I don't know, just for some reason, it almost feels like there's something on top of the entire user screen and instead of clicking on the actual buttons, I end up clicking on, I, I don't know, something, some spyware. I, I don't know, it's, I downloaded the latest driver and this is a Chinese product and we know that the Chinese government ain't exactly the most privacy concerned. Great, there goes my chances of releasing this in China. Oh, whatever, it was gonna get pirated there anyways. Now, I did try downloading an older version of the driver and I don't think I've experienced it yet, but there is another issue that has been plaguing me and still is plaguing me whenever I use Krita and uh, a graphic... Uh, graphics tablet, a graphics tablet uh, to draw my assets. And it is the fact that if I open up Krita with the tablet already connected, I do a little bit of drawing, um, make some assets, everything works, the pen pressure works, and then I export, maybe I minimize Krita or not even just switch to a different program in the background, work there for like a few minutes. And then when I come back to Krita, the pen pressure stops working. I have to shut down Krita, save everything, shut it down, restart Krita, and then my pen pressure is back. I don't know what is causing it, and it's honestly, it's kind of annoying. I can work with it, right? It, otherwise, it's a pretty good tablet, but I would like to not have to do that. So if you have experienced this and you know what the solution is, please let me know. Once I actually got up and running, I have created a new ground texture, which involved me creating some custom animated brushes for Krita to play around with those, like the grass brush, the leaf brush, and uh, make something that's a little bit darker than the existing dirt, the very, very early, very lackluster, very lazy, quick dirt texture I put together right in the beginning of the project, because I noticed that if the dirt is very light and the grass is very light, characters don't really pop. They don't stand out. They blend too much with the background, with the, 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 the ground and dirt and the grass and foliage and everything. Now, I know that's going to be an ongoing problem that I will have to keep addressing because this is, a, generally speaking, a monochromatic game. Uh, it, it uses only one color with possible exceptions for special case scenarios. Like, I know my berries are red. I know that uh, the, some of the items I've uh, created, uh, like the life sustenance type items, uh, consumable items, they have a bit of color to them. But for the most part, this is a monochromatic game. So to make NPCs pop a little bit better, or uh, really not just NPCs, but any object of interest to pop a little bit better, uh, I decided to make the ground a little bit darker, a little bit grittier, and make the grass have a touch of texture, make it slightly darker, make give it some splotches, some uh, ink uh, stains, just to make it all sit a little bit better, and any NPC would have a much more clean look to them. So you could say this is contrast through value or through brightness, and maybe contrast through clutter, where any object that is fairly clean will stand out in front of uh, this noise. Now this brought me to the issue of grass. As soon as I've added the grass to this game by the use of the multi-mesh instance, the entire game environment just immediately popped. It was literally free fidelity. Because a grassland that has grass uh, with some dimension to it looks a lot more interesting than just flat terrain with a flat texture. I just felt the, the forest immediately got a lot more immersive. Here's the only problem. 
I'm using a multi-mesh instance node in order to populate grass on all of the terrain. And for the terrain, I use a plugin called Height Map Terrain for Godot 3 and Godot 4 made by a gentleman named Zillin. Now this terrain system does offer foliage placement tools. The only problem is that those foliage placement tools, as far as I know, are hard-coded to work with their shader. And there are particular requirements that I need my grass to have, like for example, the Y billboard effect, where it always looks at the camera. I may also want to add a little bit of transmission so that if there's a light behind the grass, the grass isn't just completely fully black. So I'll be at the Zillin Terrain foliage tools are really cool because uh, I can place or paint uh, any kind of foliage on anywhere on the terrain right away. I have to rely on some sort of a custom solution to populate grass all over the terrain, and that happens to be the multi-mesh instance node. Now, the multi-mesh instance node is really cool. It allows you to essentially render thousands, thousands of instances of a single mesh and uh, shader uh, at your disposal. It is quite literally a perfect match for displaying a lot of grass, a lot of foliage, right? A lot of trees. But the problem is that in order to do this, you have to go to the toolbar while you have the multi-mesh instance node selected. You click on the custom menu that appears. Uh, you click populate mesh on surface or something along those lines. And then you have to select two things. You have to select the surface onto which to populate. So that's my terrain and the object which I want to populate, which is my mesh instance, a single instance of the grass or uh, some sort of piece of foliage, a stick, a twig, a rock, etc. Well, wh what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that every time I adjust the terrain, I have to regenerate the entire multi-mesh instance, which means that if I have generated a multi-mesh instance um, once, it has randomly placed all of the foliage and it done so in a really nice appealing manner that I liked. As soon as uh, I change the terrain and I need to regenerate it, well, I, that's it. I have to go ahead and lose that particular arrangement. There's no way to, uh, say, have it recalculate just the Y position, the up and down position of each instance. You just have to lose the whole thing and do it from scratch. Not only that, there's actually no real way to select the terrain within that panel uh, in order to populate the grass onto the terrain. Instead, I have to hop over to the Zillin Terrain plugin. I have to use its menu in order to generate a solid mesh, a, just a ginormous mesh, which represents your general terrain. You would set the resolution to make sure that it doesn't literally destroy your uh, computer resources. And then I have to give it like a few seconds up to a minute to generate that terrain. Uh, I have a pretty old system, Core i5-4590, so, you know, I gotta wait a bit. And after it's generated, only then can I go to the multi-mesh instance and then select the terrain to be populated with the grass. I have to repeat this process every single time I would like to generate grass or update grass onto the terrain. Every time I change the terrain, this is the process I have to repeat. So, I figured now is probably the best time to try to experiment with the uh, multi-mesh instance functions. So multi-mesh instance contains a resource called multi-mesh. And then if you click on that resource, if you look up the documentation for that resource, you will find all sorts of functions and properties that you can use to quite literally manually adjust each and every instance within that multi-mesh. Now, I do have a particular complaint why is changing the number of instances destroy all the transforms for all the instances? Does not make sense. I think it should be, if you're adding additional instances, those will be located in the beginning, but if you're removing instances, just remove them from the end. Why does everything need to lose transforms? But that's besides the point. I could always write a script that goes through the instances, copies their transforms into an array, uh, backs them up, and then reapplies them to the new set. That's not a problem. So what I've done is I've created essentially an instance scattering tool. What it does is it uses a child node collision shape. So it has to come with a collision shape. It uh, looks at the size of the collision shape, which is, right now it just uses a box, takes a look at the extents of the collision shape, and it populates randomly all of the grass 
within the boundaries of that box. So it uses the, the dimensions of the collision shape to determine how far the grass needs to be populated. Now, this addresses two particular issues with the multi-mesh instance. First of all, multi-mesh instances will cover everything, the entire plane of the, of, of the surface. When you use that built-in tool, when you use that built-in panel, you have to give it the surface you're, you're going to be populating with the foliage and then the mesh of the foliage itself. So because Zillin's terrain doesn't generate little chunks, it just generates the entire terrain all at once. I have to select the entire terrain all at once and the multi-mesh instance ends up populating the grass across the entire freaking map. Now, the problem is that multi-mesh instance has a limit. It is only uh, capable of displaying or containing 64,000-ish, give or take, instances. And this has to do with, uh, with the variable type or data type limitation. I think it's a 16-bit integer. So, uh, 64, first of all, 64,000 instances of grass is not enough to uh, make for a dense grass effect. Uh, the grass is just going to be too sparse. So I had to resort to using two multi-mesh instances, maybe even three, and then supplying the different designs in order to pull this off. But even that is not ideal because that means that at all times, my entire map is displaying 64,000 pieces of grass. Yes, the multi-mesh instance is um, optimized for that kind of operation where you have to display hundreds, if not thousands of something. But once you have two 64,000, maybe even three 64,000 count multi-mesh instances, you're gonna see performance drop. It makes a lot more sense to have smaller regions that maybe display, I don't know, like 2,000 units, 1,000 and a half units. And then each one of these multi-mesh instances in their particular respective region can be toggled on and off based on the distance of the player. I mean, if it's outside of the render region, why does it need to be visible at all? If you have a single multi-mesh instance uh, handling all of the grass in the entire map, there's no way to disable the grass that is, let's say, on the other side of the map because it's a part of the same multi-mesh instance. There is technically a visibility property that determines how many instances can be visible at once, but this means that you can't really do stuff like this region is slightly more dense and that region is slightly less dense because the limit might work in a less dense area, but it will not work in a more dense area. You'll quite literally see grass popping in and out of existence in the uh, just in the periphery or uh, right at the cutoff edge of the camera rendering clip, uh, clip plane. And even if that is not a big issue, there is still one more thing I have to deal with. It's just one single grass instance. I cannot have multiple designs of grass in one single multi-mesh instance, which is why I honestly think it might be a good idea to add another type of resource, which would be a multi-multi-mesh resource where you can supply multiple of these things. Uh, other than that, I, I think I technically can just use two multi-mesh instances in the same place, but, you know, would be nice, I think, maybe. So, in any case, this tool is behaving in pretty much the same way as, uh, uh, what is it, the scatter plugin uh, that uh, somebody else had uh, created a little while ago. Yes, I could have used the scatter plugin to make this, but then I wouldn't have learned how to use multi-mesh instances, would I? Right? So, yes, there's technically solutions out there, but my goal with this is to learn how to use these tools um, in equal part to also making a game. So yes, I want to make these games for sure, but I also want to learn something in the process. Of course, if it's all about programming, I'd probably lose my damn mind. So I like to hop between the various aspects, various components of this project. And uh, here I decided to put together some uh, little survival set pieces. This is supposed to be a drying rack or some sort of a makeshift shelving unit or drying apparatus. Uh, in this case, I created a base drawing of some sort of a three stick based rack. And then using separate layers, I uh, created variations of it storing some dried fish, some clothing, or just an empty rack by itself. I haven't done so, but I think I can make it so that when the player walks up to it and interacts with it, uh, they can either pick up the fish, which means they'll just swap its sprite back to the empty rack, or they can pick up the uh, piece of clothing, which would usually appear as a rag. But hey, the uh, form factor and the style of this game 
definitely does make it very easy to create new set pieces. It quite literally just a comic book two-dimensional drawing. Now, while thinking about the presentation of how the player is going to discover these locations, what kind of a scenic view I'd like to present, uh, I actually figured that uh, maybe having the character standing on the side of a cliff, looking out in the distance, looking out in the ocean, uh, would be a pretty nice presentation. Of course, I don't have any cliffs yet, so this was time for me to try to make some. Now, I started this process in Blender by modeling out a... Uh, modeling out, really just creating a, uh, a simple sphere, then using a Veroni texture with a displacement modifier to create interesting rock-like or cliff-like shapes. And initially I started painting it or texturing it within Blender, but then I realized that there's probably going to be a bunch of other stuff that I wanted to add to the texture, like a little bit of dirt, a little bit of noise, a little bit of uh, maybe context-aware effects. And I know that Blender can do it, if you sink in enough time into making some sort of a complex shader that does edge detection or you try something with geometry nodes. But after that, you still have to bake this stuff and export this stuff. So I didn't think that Blender's texturing tools were a fast enough tool to texture this rock. And because I've invested into Substance Painter a long time ago, I just ended up using that. In Substance Painter, the whole process took me all of like a few minutes. Just bake the geometry into the texture maps and then you can use all sorts of generators to do edge detection, crease detection, crevices, ambient occlusion. And at that point, it was just a, a very, very simple process. Once I put all the resources back into Godot Engine, I could basically just rotate this rock and scale it up and down and face it in every which way to create an interesting cliff-like setting. And it wasn't until I actually placed these cliffs that I honestly just got a completely different idea of having these rocks block out uh, or isolate a little sand path from the camp uh, onto the beach. And then instead of having the characters sit on these, uh, on these rocks, on this cliffside, Instead, she's going to be further down on the beach, uh, maybe even on the pier, uh, looking out into the ocean. Speaking of the ocean, uh, there is supposed to be an ocean, big body of water um, in this game. We already have a smaller one for little ponds and lakes. Uh, this would be something that's much more turbulent, much more violent, uh, much more scenic. And it's something that's going to play more than just a, a, just a visual uh, role in the game. This is where good old shaders come into play. Now, I honestly would have loved to just use the visual shaders, but there's a particular effect that um, I need to achieve, which is uh, having the water slowly fade to invisibility when it uh, approaches other geometry. Now, that is a default feature of a spatial uh, material, the standard spatial shader, but there's no way to, say, start with a spatial shader and then convert it to a visual shader. You can only convert it to a code shader. So the, the rest of the shader code, like um, blending and combining various gradients and noise textures for doing displacement and waves uh, in the vertex shader and then adding some color data and brightness data based on the height of the waves, that was done in the fragment shader. There's a particular effect that I also want to add, which I haven't added it yet, uh, but I wanted to simulate the waves breaching. Uh, of course, the actual breaching part would be, I think, way too complex for my shader skill, but specifically the foam that you would usually see on the breaching part of the waves, I think I would really like to achieve something like that. Nevertheless, I have programmed the shader with a number of uniforms, which are basically properties that you can control in the inspector. And these are very basic properties that you would find in an ocean shader. Things like the height of the primary wave, the height of the secondary wave, which are used for displacement, and they both clash together with some mathematics the scale of the primary wave, the scale of the secondary wave, as well as some color parameters, like how strong is the transition from the darker color to a lighter color based on how far down a wave is at the moment. I even made it so that the water that is located closer to the shore is less turbulent than the water that's further out into the sea. And that was achieved by simply having a single gradient image 
fed into the shader and the gradient image was going from black to white where there's black data you see very little disruption very little disturbance for the majority it's basically just color in those locations and then as the gradient is becoming more and more white uh, you see the waves start to pick up the height data starts to get applied turbulence and all that jazz once the water was in place I felt that having the character just simply on the beach wasn't really looking effective enough so I figured I'm actually gonna place some sort of a pier a very rickety very old very destroyed looking pier uh, a dock of some kind uh, and the character will be standing right at the tip of that dock now this is where I got an idea to try a bit of a more modular approach to building out this particular prop instead of modeling out the whole dock right away I instead decided to create a small set of planks a small set of two by fours and a small set of wooden logs I would texture each and every one of these props right away all of their color data, which is just black and white monochromatic color data, would be located on one single texture. And then to create the actual dock, I would just copy paste all of these pre-made assets and then use them like Legos to build out the actual dock prop. See, this is where there's no one particular way of creating props. In this case, I'm quite literally starting from the ass end of the whole process. Instead of modeling out the entire prop from start to finish and then UV unwrapping it, UV mapping it, and then extracting it and texturing it in Substance Painter, instead I have pre-created and pre-fractured, pre-textured all of the pieces and then just use them to build out the prop. I gotta say, it does save a lot of time on texturing because everything's already textured. You can think of it as you creating the tiled seamless texture of ground, a tiled seamless texture of rocks, a tiled seamless texture of brick, of soil, of grass, and then you can just reuse that texture map on any body of land you wish. Except in this case, I'm applying the same exact logic to the models themselves. After finishing the pier, I actually reused some of the pieces of the pier to create a little staircase that uh, leads up to the elevated pier. I thought it looked better than just having the pier end itself into the sand. When I was working on the little pond area, I had an idea for a prop, which is essentially an elevated fishing shack uh, on one of the sides of the pond's beach. And I figured this would be the perfect time to actually make that prop because here I have a whole bunch of planks, a whole bunch of logs, and a whole bunch of 2 by 4s that I can use to create this structure. Again, quite literally just break this apart, maybe even uh, I ended up reusing a portion of the pier itself for the bridge. Then hop on over back to the project that has all of these uh, props separated as individual objects, copy, paste into this new project, and then build out the walls, the roof, the ceiling, and then I can stretch things, adjust things, make this complex looking structure out of quite literally pre-made pieces. Now, at the moment, this may sound like empty promises, but I really want to make these environments, these levels, these special locations to actually have some merit, some sort of a narrative sustenance to them. Some of these may have characters with quests, some of these may have uh, characters with silent missions, some may have a bit of environmental storytelling or some notes the player can pick up, something that paints a picture of this world and it's not just an empty throwaway husk. Now, when I was setting up the pier and placing the NPC at the very end of it, I also placed one of the pre-made torches. Uh, of course, I had to give it the ability to be turned on and non-interactable. But there's a really cool effect that uh, I accidentally stumbled upon. And it is the fact that when I have a three-dimensional sprite faking the volumetric lighting, I could actually see the silhouette of the character in the distance, uh, albeit... Sometimes the character would clip because of the way the sprite would angle itself. But if I position the light and the character just far enough away from each other, it creates a really cool effect where just as you're walking over the horizon, uh, as you're walking over the cliff, you can see in the distance this ball of light and there's a silhouette standing in it. I decided to replace the default torch, the a standard torch that the player can place on the ground uh, with uh, a static prop that cannot be interacted with because uh, I don't want the player walking up to that torch and then taking it away and then 
you know, leaving the NPC in the darkness and basically the whole effect will go out the window. Back to creator we go. I created a stand for a lantern and uh, something a bit more standard. Uh, some lantern that's akin to the one that the player has in their inventory. But this one would simply hang off the stand and uh, using a couple of stacked sine waves uh, wiggle in the wind, rock back and forth. I did have to battle the lantern's uh, glow effect and glow material for a little bit because, well, it wouldn't behave nicely with the volumetrics, the fake volumetrics, and the uh, the actual light, uh, omni-light node that eliminated the surrounding area. It took a little bit of tinkering because on one end the light would affect the lantern from the other camera angle it would not and then it would just kind of looked a little bit awkward also when you have two sprite 3ds located in the same x and z coordinate something awkward happens to the uh, stacking you can kind of see one sprite that's visibly behind another sprite but it's being rendered on top now because this is a fairly simplified style i don't tend to pay attention too much to these kinds of little graphical glitches. I mean, there's gonna be some compromise that needs to happen and I really can't get everything to be perfect because if I focus on everything being absolutely perfect, I would have been still working on grass at this point. Now, this is the last video that I've spent working on the Child of Ether project. And the last thing I've done was put a little bit more work into the campfire mechanic. At this point, I'm still trying to figure out the most appropriate, most uh, interactive or intuitive way of cooking in the game. And this is where I got an idea for maybe implementing some sort of a dual cooking system. The simple one, the emergency one, and the more advanced one. So check this out. Whenever you have a campfire on the ground, you will be given a number of item slots in that campfire. And what you can do is you can place immediately cookable items into that campfire, which usually means raw meat, raw fish. Maybe I'll go for more than one type of meat. So, you know, you get the loins, the ribs, and you drag and drop those items into the inventory slot of the campfire, and that's it. This will effectively cook that particular piece of meat. However, the resulting cooked food is not really gonna be very useful in, let's say, a combat scenario where you need to regain a whole bunch of action points. It'll be good in the pinch in order to resolve hunger, maybe fix a little bit of health, but if you want something that's really AP rich, you're gonna have to use a skillet. And a skillet will allow you to cook your meat with the other ingredients like meat, garlic, salt, spices, and one piece of meat could be used to create a variety of dishes. And maybe in this case, the variety of dishes will aid in a variety of stats. The advanced cooking I have yet to work on, but the simple cooking was actually fairly simple to implement. In the good old standard modular development process, all I did is just take the same exact inventory slot scene that I use for my developer panel, the player's inventory, chests and crates inventories, and I just placed four of them right underneath the campfire. Realistically, all that needs to be satisfied are the requirements, like the campfire would now need to have an inventory variable, an inventory open variable, which tells the slot whether or not it can be interacted with, and the campfire itself will now essentially go through its inventory variable and periodically check if there's something in there. Now, this is where I wanted to make sure that there is gameplay and there's rewards and there's punishments for uh, neglecting the campfire. This is an idea that I'm borrowing from the forest where if you leave a piece of meat in the fire, it's just gonna get burnt and it's not gonna be as beneficial. In my case, it's literally going to turn to a piece of coal, which has its own utilities, but you know, if you're cooking a piece of meat, you probably wanna eat a piece of meat. So if you leave a piece of raw meat or raw fish neglected in the fire, it is going to turn into charcoal. Not only that, if you let the fire die, which was not a system up until this point, it will immediately ruin all the food within it. And this is where I am probably not gonna get too many kind responses of what, why, why does it ruin the food? Why can't it just stop cooking it? Well, so that you wouldn't neglect the fire. I'm really trying to bring a lot of gameplay functionality to these objects so they're not just like one trick ponies. The fire is going to be useful for deterring a particular type of enemy. The fire is going to be useful for making very quick cooking. 
The fire can be used to convert certain resources into others, maybe even activate some of the resources. But of course, if there's one thing that I have learned, and it's the game starts becoming more engaging when there are certain risks involved. The prospect of losing whatever you've put into the fire should hypothetically keep you on the edge and keep you engaged with the fire. So I'm essentially trying to add some risk in order to spice up this particular mechanic. This concludes the progress I've made since the last update on the Child of Ether. Let's uh, move on to the next project. Man, let me tell you, I've been putting this mechanic off for so long, even though it's going to be one of the most important mechanics in this game. And this is something that I'm going to have to figure out for the Atomicon project as well, and that would be interactive terminals. As I have mentioned before, this project will technically act as a sandbox for me to figure out a lot of the mechanics I would like to put into the Atomicon project. That's the Fallout-like project. It's also why I'm trying to base a lot of the visuals for the technology to look like retro-futuristic Art Deco-style tech. Now, we're talking about interactable user interface. Uh, that is a subject that has, I'm sure, been done to death in plenty of examples. And the way I've achieved it is by essentially creating a separate scene that acts as a singleton, which contains a totally separate viewport within which I have nested generic terminal user interface code. So whenever you're interacting with the terminal, what that terminal will do is it will address the screen of the terminal, which is a separate mesh. It will swap out its material for one that is capable of displaying a viewport. Technically, this is done with your good old standard spatial material, and you simply go into the albedo map and the emissive map, you give them a viewport texture, and then you set the path of the texture to be the path of the singleton. As soon as you're done interacting with the terminal, of course, I wanted to make sure that uh, it clears the screen so that whatever menu you were messing around with in another terminal doesn't get magically ported to every terminal in the game. So it simply backpedals and swaps back to some sort of a generic screen material. The interface data structure, which is just a basic old dictionary, is designed in such a way where I can create menus inside of submenus, inside of submenus, inside of submenus. I can go as infinite as I want. And there's really, besides the submenus, there's only three types of interactable components on the user interface. First one being a good old standard multi-page text. It's essentially just an array with a whole bunch of text uh, inside of it for narrative. I can write up dialogues between characters. I can write up documentation. I can write up notes that characters left for themselves. Another type of interaction is a uh, trigger interaction. This type of interaction allows me to pair this terminal with another node and tell the terminal to trigger that node when the player presses the button. And the, of course, the last one would be the toggle interaction, which acts kind of like trigger, but it allows you to toggle something either on or off. I draw a distinction between trigger and toggle because trigger doesn't really care what the final node does. It just tells it to run the trigger command and then whatever it needs to do, it just does it. Toggle, however, explicitly can either be toggled on or off. And it is the job of the terminal to specify which operation it is going to be. Here's another interesting thing I've added to the project, uh, a generic item receptacle. This is actually an idea that one of my students came up with when we were trying to figure out a solution for this massive interaction heavy gameplay where you have to be able to deposit various items, just all sorts of items in receptacles, in slots, in, in puzzle pieces. You have gears that have to be inserted into a machine. You have potions that have to be inserted into a lion statue's mouth. You have gems that have to be inserted in various slots. So having programmed enough of insertable objects, it really didn't make sense that we would have to program each and every single one of those from scratch every time we add another insertable puzzle. So what we came up with, and technically what the student came up with, is to use an area node to act as a generic receptacle, generic insertable receptacle. And essentially what it does is it just sits there. 
it is detected by the player. When the player looks at it, there's a prompt that the player can interact with it. And the generic insertable object essentially contains an array of item keys that this particular insertable object is capable of accepting. So that you wouldn't end up putting unrelated objects like a lever into the statue of a lion. The object does all the filtering and if it is capable of accepting the item, it takes it, tells the player that the item has been accepted and removes it from the player's inventory. From that point on, it is the job of the object within which this generic insert node is sitting to determine what to do with this item. So thankfully, my teachings about doing modular programming and creating modular reusable systems is starting to take roots within my students as well. An auditorium hall is one of the locations that the player can discover. This location is paramount to progressing the story forward as the player is going to discover some clues, narrative and direction towards their next destination. So I needed to make sure the player spent some decent amount of time in this area. But before I can start thinking about gameplay, I just wanted to figure out how to basically block out this entire space. I knew from the basic concepts that this would be a two story location. I knew that it was going to be pretty large and I knew that the player is going to have to solve some sort of a relatively average and complexity puzzle to get to the reward. After blocking down the geometry for the location, I didn't really have a lot of ideas to start with on what would be, you know, interesting gameplay in a location like this. So I just took an overview screenshot into Krita and started blocking down some ideas and essentially it's just a amalgamation of various minor pretty common puzzle pieces like a little bit of platforming a little bit of platform up and down manipulation a bit of a balancing act between power consumption and power delivery there's a bit of a timing component too so the player has to make it in time before the path forward is blocked so a lot of the little pieces that are pretty common in quite a lot of puzzles but with the prospect of being able to reveal more of the mystery that the player follows along, perhaps these mechanics won't seem as mundane. Now, even though technically this screenshot is the gameplay, which technically tells you how to play it, it essentially spoils it, I'm gonna try not to do too much of that. Uh, if there's a location that I'm working on, I'm going to make sure that the gameplay to it stays hopefully relatively unspoiled and then you just see the progress on the props and texturing maybe a little bit of features but not the solutions to the puzzles since this is an auditorium type location there's a particular prop i wanted to put in that ended up getting me to start taking notes from the books of frictional games releases here is a three unit lighting control module essentially a desk with three levers that the player has to use in order to raise and lower platforms that are seen in the background. The player needs to use these platforms to create a stable path in order to get into a vent. Now, I am a huge sucker for any game that gives you extra detailed interaction with props or technology within the game. When there's a cool looking console, that's great. When there's a cool looking console that you can interact with, that's even better. When there's a cool looking console where you can interact with multiple individual components, oh God, I'm about to bust a nut just talking about it. <clears throat> Anyways, the way the levers can be interacted with is by looking at them, then left clicking with your mouse button, and then the up and down movement of the mouse button will actually translate to the levers up and down rotation. Not only that, I have made the levers snap to the nearest value, so the player will have to push the mouse extra hard to switch it to the next position. The only thing that we really need at this point is to implement haptic feedback with rumble into mice. Why haven't we done that yet? I can make the mouse rumble to simulate the sensation of the levers being switched from one position to another. Now the create a document sketch only depicts the base gameplay idea. The player has to go here, then here, then resolve this particular micro puzzle, and then they will gain access to this location. They can do a little bit of platforming here, but the actual concrete details are yet to be developed. Sometimes this approach works, sometimes it doesn't. It seems more to be based on inspiration and some interesting ideas rather than any particular technique. So I knew that the player has to platform over these uh, chairs until they get to some sort of a divot or some sort of a uh, scaffolding that they can climb up to the higher level. The higher level is essentially made out of catwalks that are um, interchanged or interconnected. Some of the passages are blocked off and the player has to find a way to get to the platforms, the lighting fixtures. 
Now, I usually tend to create geometry that I intend on using in the final game right away. And when it comes to these catwalks, I think I have inadvertently ended up accidentally creating a kit, essentially a set of catwalks that I can replicate, duplicate, move around and build out these more uh, complex catwalk structures out of just these slices. It's very easy to lose track of all the various different processes that I can employ in creating of the levels. And this was an interesting reminder that I could just create a modular kit and then connect it, interconnect it, and build out all sorts of passageways. Almost like a tile set in 2D, but in this case it's 3D and not really grid map related. I gotta say the Blender's cell fracture add-on has been absolutely imperative in creating all sorts of destructions out of these uh, pre-existing pieces of geometry. Something I wanted to experiment is attracting the player's attention to the second floor of this area because there is a vital component, a key objective that the player needs to reach in order to progress the story or even know where to go next. So I used the Cell Fracture plugin in Blender to fracture the floor in many chunks, deleted the one that's closest to a focal point I want the player to notice. And the idea was to have a bunch of debris fall down under gravity, uh, triggered by the player walking close enough to the zone. Essentially a trigger zone that causes a bunch of little rocks to fall down on the gravity. Now a lot of the stuff is technically still experimental because I haven't even touched the subject of lighting and shadows. At this point, yes, this is way too dark to even notice, but the whole point is for me to have some sort of a rudimentary mechanic already in place, figure out how to get all these rigid bodies to fall and get triggered, and uh, when it comes down later down the line to polish, that's when we'll worry about angling this uh, environment in such a way where the lighting and shadow falls just the right way. Now to make sure I don't lose track of what it is that I'm working towards or what the immediate next goals are, I have arranged the entire narrative in the order that the player is supposed to discover it within the factor analysis graphing tool of our Siren story writing web application. This is technically you could consider to be an open world game, but the story has to be revealed in a particular linear fashion. So I thought about this for a while on how I can actually deliver the story that takes place in an open, well, relatively open world, but is revealed in a particular order. I think making this into a truly open world game would be a little bit too much of a task for just me alone as a writer, because I have to now think about how to make sure that the story makes sense no matter which point you start the story from. And this is supposed to be a fairly short project too, so I don't want to overscope it and make it bigger than it actually needs to be. So it is going to be a linear story, it is discovered in a particular order, and to help me stay on track and know what has to be done next, I've plotted out the entire line in this graphing tool. Here I know where the player starts, what clues is the player supposed to receive, what objectives the player is supposed to define, what obstacles and what resolutions to those obstacles the player will need to engage in. It's all essentially plotted out within this graphing tool instead of, say, a work document, which is what you'd find usually with uh, game design documents. Of course, once in a while, to break the monotony, I switch to some good old standard dumb prop making. Usually when you're doing something like this, you just turn your brain off and make some props, do some 3D modeling. Just let your brain rest because most of this stuff is pretty autonomous. In this case, I made a little, I think it's like a tool, portable tool stand or tool shelf. Something you'd find in a shop or maybe some sort of an industrial installation. Following along with the little sketch of the gameplay in this area that I put together in Creator earlier, I modeled the essentially the other end of the vent that the player is supposed to climb out of. This particular air vent is supposed to be controlled by a terminal on the other side at the bottom of the auditorium. It cannot be pried open or kicked open. The player has to specifically power the mechanics, power the this particular chunk of the bunker with batteries, uh, power the computer terminal, enter the menu, and then press the button to interact with the vent. The vent will open up, but only for a short period of time. Why exactly? I will leave that for the player to find out when they play the game, but it is a puzzle where the player has to figure out how to make it uh, to the other opening of the vent before it closes. I deviated a little bit from the puzzle in the auditorium to address a particular mechanic that has been pretty much around for a while, almost since the beginning of the game, which is the map and the GPS uh, units. I actually wanted to maybe revise the way the coordinate system works, because I believe 
In this particular case, the Y axis was being displayed first and the X axis being displayed second, which seemed a little awkward. I might have to improve the labeling. Uh, as a matter of fact, I might have to improve the sizes of those uh, writings as well. But um, I had to swap out the values to make sure that they're correlating correctly and that the top left corner of the map corresponds to the top left corner of the level. Now, this had pointed out a particular flaw in my logic. How the hell is the player supposed to know where is the top left corner of the map? And of course, this is where, you know, you recall to Minecraft, you recall to uh, all these uh, all these survival games that have an open world and you realize that they all have a compass. So off I go making a compass object so that the player can tell where the hell they're located on the entire map. Basically, I just took the camera's global rotation on the y-axis, normalized it, turned it into an angle, and then interpolated the needle of the compass to always slowly move towards facing that angle. Now, it makes logical sense that the compass should probably be in front of you when you open up the map, so that the, the, all, all these tools kind of work together. You have the GPS, which tells you your current location somewhere on the map. You have the compass, which tells you where the north is, so you can make sure the map is uh, actually pointing north when you're referencing it. But it doesn't feel like gameplay. You see, this is one of those things where I, I don't necessarily like when games just give you stuff it's just oh here you go just unearned there you go there's a solution to all your problems i understand doing that on the most basic core gameplay objects that the player is supposed to use throughout the entire game giving them early kind of makes sense but what i figured is for the compass what i'm gonna do is not bundle it with the rest of the tool set early on as a matter of fact the player is going to get the map as a separate object and the player is going to get the gps as a separate object which will feel a little clunky in the beginning until the player finds a crafting bench somewhere out in the desolate area and then use the crafting bench to combine the GPS and the map together. And then the player can also combine the, the GPS with the map and the compass together to get the full bundle that only occupies one single slot in the inventory. See, to me, that seems better because now it's something the player does rather than something that's just given. This is a fairly small project, so I'm trying to gamify as many things as possible. I switched my attention to a different set prop, which is going to be reoccurring all throughout the Swamplands, which is a black box. It's a recording device which was equipped into every major part of the bunker, and the player will be able to use a special remote control in order to interact with that black box and listen to the audio tapes on them. This is actually one of the ways the player is going to be discovering the narrative, the story, piece by piece, segment by segment, event by event, as the player unlocks and uh, gets into all these um, uh, key core locations. These will contain the most important information of all, and I'm gonna see about trying to make sure that I condition the player to recognize that these boxes are important early on by having this box, maybe even multiple times, contain very useful information that aids the player in their journey. Maybe even gives them access to some sort of, um, some sort of resources, which I just got an idea as I'm talking about this. I can have a recording in one of these boxes where a character's talking, but in the background you can hear uh, a dial tone. You can hear um, somebody uh, messing around with a keypad, and you can hear that each key has a different tone, giving you the password. I'm sure I've seen this somewhere in another game. I'm using it. The hell with you all. I don't care. I am using this idea. Now, in hindsight, looking at this prop, dear God, did I absolutely over-engineer it. Um, I don't think I'm even gonna end up using this particular prop. I might end up having it as a set piece in like a audio processing or, or radiography room, communications office. This thing is just, first of all, it's way too massive. I tried to make it um, realistic by having the platters move and the taking out the discs from the slots and then the player would be able to see how many slots there are see how many tapes there are uh there would be a, a reading head going up and down swiveling uh rotating picking things up placing things down it is just way over the top um so i might just end up having this piece as uh maybe like a background background prop or maybe make use of the fact that it has so many moving parts in some sort of an ambient thing. Like, I don't know, there's a ghost nearby and all the electronics go haywire. Ooh. You know, it's learning experience. I think there, 
there was a way to make this much, much more compact, much less bulky, much, uh, much more elegant, I should say. Less moving parts. Less is more kind of deal. More minimal design. Now I'm gonna take a pause here and uh, give you guys a listen for what we've been cooking up with the voice actress. For the past couple of months, we've been running these uh, recording sessions where we would get on the Zoom call and open up the script and then do a live recording. Um, and most often I would listen to the way the vocal line sounds and I'll probably adjust a few things here and there because it's usually not until you hear the dialogue that you start understanding if something works or doesn't. Now, this works for me because I get to get that perfect take. This also works for the voice talent because we basically take what would have taken probably three days, five days, seven days. It gets all exponentially longer based on um, how long the script is. And then we contract it into basically like a one hour, two hour recording session. And the most important thing is that I take over the process of picking takes, I took over the process of doing post-processing. All I need are just the raw files and we're good to go. So here, take a listen to this little snippet of a black box recording that you're supposed to find in the science lab segment of the bunker. I've hardly had the luxury of so much as even acknowledging your existence today. What with all the time I'm about to spend on, you know, that side of the lab, basking in the revelation of opening the thing up. Beautiful. Oh, that's fantastic. Let me do one more. Mm hmm After the car drives by. Mm hmm There we go. I've hardly had the luxury of so much as even acknowledging your existence today. What with all the time I'm about to spend on, you know, that side of the lab, basking in the revelation of opening the thing up. All right. Mm hmm Okay. Perfect. Absolutely brilliant. I honestly want to make sure that there's voice acting, at least some sort of voice acting in a lot of my projects because I've played enough of the silent games. They work to a particular extent, but you really don't need to try to save up for the big names in the voice acting. You can really find somebody who's just starting out, somebody who's freelancing, and something who can work within your budget to get some sort of voicing in. I mean, it you have to have talent to do really bad voice acting. And I think that I've been able to, so far, find some pretty nice sounding voice work. The name of the voice actress is Catherine Pepin. You can find her on Fiverr. And I can't wait to do some more work with her because she she has been able to hone in on the character types across Artag Rise, across this project. And I'm thinking I'm also going to use her in uh, the Child of Ether project. And she gets the job done. I would really hate to throw away her talent on some sort of a minor temporary throwaway character. So uh, moving on, of course, the black box needs to have the remote that the player uses to interact with the black box to get the audio recording off of it. I didn't bother putting in any switches or any tapes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I haven't even programmed this thing as of yet. I just modeled it and placed it as an inventory item. And reason being is uh, until I actually have full voice recordings for at least a couple of uh, interactions, a couple of the black boxes, there's no real sense in even programming this thing because there's, there's nothing to really test it with. Yes, I could record the voices myself or use placeholders, but there's plenty of other stuff to do in this project, so I think I'll just wait. By the way, fellas, the more hats you can buy, the more voice actors I can hire. Do it. Do it for the support of the industry. God knows the actors could use a little help with all the strikes and, you know, unionization. Taking a little break, I decided to put together some fencing. This will be a set variety of fence pieces that I will block out the entire map so the player can't leave the boundaries. The cell fracture plugin comes to the rescue that allowed me to create some very interesting broken components and broken concrete bases for these fences. Very cool stuff. It really knows what Blender has to offer and what tools it's made of. I think I should start learning geometry nodes because I've seen some real cool stuff made with that. I've also started using the lattice tool quite a bit more in Blender in order to distort props and objects and effectively get more variety out of essentially the same prop. First time I finally decided to use the lattice tool was with the catwalks in the auditorium. I mean, it's quite literally free variety for your props. Just slap a lattice modifier, add a lattice mesh, and then distort the mesh and that'll distort the object. And as a result, you get yourself extra varieties of the same prop at minimum effort. This is where I decided to do some messing around with the terrain. I knew that the player is supposed to arrive on a side of the abandoned road and then there will be an obstacle in the way and the player would have to sidetrack off into the uh, the swamps. So Zillin's terrain to the rescue. 
The Terrain plugin actually contains a generator that allows you to create uh, noise-based uh, base terrain, and then you can morph all the additional geometry, hills, and crevices uh, that you want afterwards. I made a proposition recently on the, uh, the GitHub for this plugin to allow us to mask certain zones of the terrain and then reuse the generator so that you could create a segment of the terrain that has hills, a segment of the terrain uh, in another place that has marshes, and then something more valley-based and something more um, uh, plain-based. Because right now there's just one single terrain, one single generator, and then if you want to generate again, you have to lose everything you've done up until this point. Also, another comment on the Zillin's terrain. I don't know if I did something wrong, but I couldn't get height data to actually display correctly, no matter how I swing that height map. And I'm not sure if it's height based or if it's depth based. I know that the Godot's standard shader, uh, the spatial shader, contains depth map, which means it uh, tessellates or uh, not tessellates, but it creates parallax layers uh, in the terrain w that gives you the illusion of depth. This is kind of one of the plights of these terrain modules that are coming out. It's all fine and dandy that you can sculpt it, but then when it comes down to texturing, suddenly you have less than a standard um, standard shader, right? Where's our where's our height map or depth map, I should say? Where's our glow maps, right? I mean, albedo on normal map is fine, but roughness, at least let us keep roughness. Which Zillin terrain does allow you to keep roughness, but that other terrain, the Terrain 3D plugin, I think it... Uh, it, it makes you forego the roughness for the single slider that makes everything wet or everything dry. And that's not really something I think is intuitive or flexible. Since I've carved out a patch of land, which the player will be following down the road, it was time to actually create the road mesh. I basically just painted a, a quick outline of a road, turned it into a mesh, filled it, extruded it, and then did a bit of beveling, and that's about it. It is a little barebone because when I use uh, reference images, for example, how the roads were made in Fallout 3, there are crevices and divots and cracks all over the road, so I think um, I might come back to this and do another revision. Or, you know, just simply add additional varieties of the, uh, of the roads. Now, props like these actually allow me to delve into the library of textures and maps I've amassed over the years. I have already shared this before, I'm pretty sure, but I like this company called CG Axis, who periodically make a new texture pack and they sell it on the sale for about 50 bucks. They always have these perpetual sales for texture packs and it's a very, I would say, affordable way to amass a pretty respectable, pretty sizable and very nice looking uh, texture set over the course of maybe like a couple of years. I gotta say, what happens a lot of times is that instead of delving into the texture maps to find an appropriate texture for something I've already modeled, sometimes I'll just browse these packs and see if inspiration hits. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that the abandoned demolished church prop uh, location in this game is actually directly based on a texture map that I found in an older physical library, one of their really cool library sets, uh, which contained this broken up rotten wood hardwood floorboard texture map. It, honestly, it looks fantastic. And this is something that also happens when I'm doing, uh, when I'm writing music. Sometimes I'll just find an instrument as I'm browsing through endless libraries of sounds to find something appropriate. I would come across the sound and as soon as I play a chord, I, instantly I got imagery of some sort of a level or enemy or some sort of a scene, some sort of a, a, a composition. It, it's, it's amazing. I can pull infinite inspiration from just sounds and textures alone. It's a little ass backwards when you think about it, but hey, you know, as long as you make some quality content, right? Now here I wanted to experiment a little bit with the multi-mesh instance node, and this was actually before I discovered all the uh, functions and methods and I made the prop distribution tool in the Child of Ether project you saw in the previous segment. So I wanted to see if I could repopulate the trees all over the map and good God, is this a long ass process? You actually uh, get to see me having to go through the terrain and then generate a physical mesh, uh, select that mesh in the in the tool. It's It takes a while, especially when you try to rapidly reiterate, it just doesn't work. Uh, not only that, I found that uh, the trees were once again too sparsely distributed between one another because of the 16 bit integer limit. And uh, I think I'm actually gonna end up repeating the same thing I've done 
in the other project uh, where I would just write a little tool for scattering these trees, randomly rotating them, and also likely adding static bodies with cylinders into the world automatically so that every tree essentially has uh, a collision shape to it. As a matter of fact, I believe I had to create a very simplified mesh specifically for these trees to have collisions. It's still triplanar collisions uh, for a static body though. I couldn't just simply use the built-in Godot's feature where you click on the mesh and then go into the menu, mesh, and then generate a tri-mesh collision sibling, or even worse, the multi-simplified uh, collision siblings, because it would just create these like dozens and dozens and dozens, uh, sometimes up to a hundred collision shapes. Um, so I had to really take the tree, open that up in Blender, and then uh, meticulously craft a custom low poly triplanar collision. It would of course bypass all the teeny tiny branches so that you know there's no sense in calculating collisions for those, but just the major branches, the main trunk, uh, and then some of the smaller bits and pieces uh, around the middle of the tree. Now, I knew that right at the beginning of the game, the player is supposed to go through a little tutorial mandatory information zone. Uh, this was going to be some sort of a survival checkpoint where there's a tape recorder that tells the player the, the basics they need to know, gives them the address of the first location, gives them the tools, and then the basic rundown of how the game is and what they might want to look for, lay down a bit of uh, existing mystery, do a little bit of foreshadowing. So I visualized it that it's going to be some sort of a, a ravine that the player has to go through, which leads into a fenced off area with a couple of workbenches. So I've set out to create the workbenches. This wouldn't be the actual interactable workbench like I've seen before that the player can actually craft uh, stuff on. So it didn't really require as much intricate work. I've spent a little bit more time blocking out the terrain, making sure that the uh, there are zones that the player simply cannot cross. Uh, there's supposed to be a blockade down the road, place the trees. For the most part, it's more experimental than doing anything with a particular purpose. Just getting familiar with the tools and getting more acquainted with the process. A lot of this terrain work and a lot of uh, prop placements, all that good stuff, I'm gonna have to be doing this stuff in the Atomicon project as well. So for some smaller project like this, I think it's a perfect place to experiment whether or not certain approaches to prop placement and blockades and terrain are actually going to work out. Needless to say, I really like the atmosphere that uh, this orangish fog, uh, orangish haze is uh, creating, especially with all the terrain and trees, the silhouettes of them uh, slowly revealing themselves as you walk forward. I took a moment to create some road debris, which is uh, essentially a whole bunch of rocks that have been simulated in physics in Blender to fall down and scatter. And then all I did is just go through the aftermath, selected a bunch of rocks in groups, organized them into collections and then joined them. And that's it. There's no way in hell I'm going to be pre-placing each and every one of these teeny tiny rocks. So, you know, my recommendation is learn the tools of Blender uh, if you're using Blender, because you can do so many interesting things to speed up the modeling process. Like I've been using the physics simulations in Blender to create random debris scattering pretty much uh, for this entire duration of the project. If you want things to look natural, you don't want to spend time meticulously making sure things are not clipping or sitting on top of each other, hey, use physics. Man, I can't wait to get working on the Atomicum project again. I swear to God, this shit's gonna be so much fun, especially knowing that I've already figured out a lot of these things. But no, no, I am done shelving projects so I can focus on something else. I gotta finish it. I gotta finish something. Like, it takes monstrous amount of energy to, to, to basically block yourself from saying, Oh, wait a minute, I just got an idea for another game. No, 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 stop it. Bad monkey, bad. <sighs> Man, they... Ever since I discovered Fallout 3, I've just been completely in love with the genre, so I love post-apocalyptic games. I love it when they make environment interactable and the survival a partial focus of the game. But yeah, anyways, I, I, I gotta focus. Another thing I like about uh, the, the Fallout games is that sometimes you may be wandering in the middle of the wasteland and you'll come across this odd location. Like, no explanation around it. There's no, there's nothing there except for a couple of meticulously placed props that seem a bit out of place. I mean, I would have liked for there to be a little bit more sustenance in terms of content, um, place some environmental storytelling to give it a little bit more context. So 
I wanted to put something like this here, and that's where the idea of this tiny little, almost like medical stand, medical tool stand uh, came to be. I'm just going to take these props and scatter them in a, a couple of locations of the swampy forest. Maybe do a little bit of experimentation with environmental storytelling. You know, another thing that I am very fascinated about is old city infrastructure. Anything that... that um, is built for the purpose of maintaining a society. Um, this includes like roads, uh, uh, road infrastructure, city infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, radio infrastructure, uh, uh, trains, uh, rail systems, especially old versions of all that technology. I don't know why, but I just I just find that to be really fascinating. It's almost like a a window, almost like a time machine. You can think of it as 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 um unintentional time capsules, a glimpse into the past. So sometimes I just spent hours on Google Images just looking at photos of, uh, you know, old rail systems and old rail equipment uh, that hasn't really been updated or maintained in a while. You know what? I blame the American Tale cartoon series when I uh, that I used to watch as a child. There was a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of like mine carts and a lot of episodes with, uh, with spooky themes and, uh, old, old wild west themes. Uh, just puts a smile on my face when I remember it. And maybe also in part the, uh, the, what is it? The Lost Planet by the Disney. Um, and I think, and the, the Atlantis. That's right. Both of those movies are just, just mwah, absolutely phenomenal. I would place my fascination with all technology between those three. Speaking of old decrepit infrastructure, I think the topmost favorite asset to always look for and always reference is an old sawmill. I don't know what it is about the old sawmills, but they look awesome. And all that old rusty machinery, you know, just sitting there rusting away. God, what an aesthetic. So I decided to put together a couple of sketches on my spare time and uh, yeah, we're just going to model them. This is kind of the thing with indie dev is that you can't, I don't think it's possible to completely write out the entire story, the entire set of locations, everything right from the get go. I don't know how you would possibly be able to do that. I mean, I know that when you're preparing the, the design document, when you're looking for financing, uh, you got to basically show everything there is that you're planning to put into the game. I'm sure there's some wiggle room for uh, inspiration or some you know flashes of inspiration, but man, this uh, this is where the indie freedom really shines because you can you can come up with a completely wild idea right smack in the middle of developing a, a chapter for the game. And I didn't really go out of my way to hard write or hard decide any particular set of locations uh, in the script. There are certain key locations that have to happen, but there's a lot of space in between that I can use to insert additional ideas. So the sawmill, uh, as soon as I got the idea for the sawmill, I knew that there's got to be a way to motivate it to place it into the game. So it's not just like a random location that the player stumbles upon. And I did. The sawmill is going to be a location the player encounters early on, and it causes them to essentially lose a massive amount of time before the sundown, uh, and they would now find themselves in the precarious position that nightfall is here, uh, night's coming, and they now need to survive in the swamp, and they didn't make it to their destination, as they had declared in the introduction of the story. Now, while I was putting this together, Antoine, uh, who's the gentleman helping out with this project, um, had proposed a sketch of their own for a, an alternate design for the sawmill, and I liked it. And I like I like this one, and I like the other one. So we ended up deciding on using both of them, but separate them into two separate uh, locations, and it would actually perfectly neatly fall into place with a particular gameplay mechanic the, the player is going to be taking part in. Like, things could not have aligned more perfect. You see, by this point, you may have already seen me work on this in an earlier development report, but there is a central location on the map, which is a nuclear silo, which is a, a kind of a main focus of the player uh, because of the story. Now, in order to open the nuclear silo, the player has to satisfy a number of requirements, one of which is to bring enough power in order to, well, power up all the uh, pneumatic uh, systems of the nuclear silo. Now, story-wise, I've written a, uh, a very grumpy, very angry 
uh, engineer character who is not allowed to be present in the core parts of the facility, but he's still asked to fix a whole bunch of broken stuff that is constantly going haywire because their power demands are completely out of this world. So what this engineer does is he quite literally instructs a whole bunch of troops to dismantle a number of trucks so that he could use their engines as impromptu power generators. Now for them it worked and right now initially uh, I wanted to make it so that the player has to collect uh, enough gas to pour into those generators in order to make them, uh, well, power the machinery. This was the solution to one of the requirements, which is you got to bring enough power to the console and to the, the, the pneumatic system in order to open up the silo. However, the moment the idea of a sawmill came about, I had an epiphany for a much, much cooler solution to the power obstacle. Instead of bothering with these generators, I'm going to keep the generators on site. However, by the time the player gets to actually use them, one of them will be defective. And when the player attempts to actually open the silo, it overalls all of them and they all explode and break. The real solution to powering the silo is going to be a locomotive train with an onboard diesel generator that is parked on the other side of the plane in the sawmill secondary location. So the sawmill is actually made of two parts. There's the processing plant and there's the collection plant. And they have to somehow transport the lumber from one to another. So now we need to put a railroad down. And one of the player's objectives is going to be to locate the second site to find and get the locomotive out of the barn, to put it on tracks and then go service it, oil it, put the fuel in and then fire it up and then deliver it to as close of a location to the center of the map as possible and then run a bunch of wires from the diesel train to the electrical fuse box of the silo and then use it as a power source. All of my favorite components are coming together. We have uh, old technology being revived back to life. We have mysteries being un unraveled. We have an environment that is more interactive than just walk up and press E. Woo. Gameplay. So I thought this was a really cool idea and this gives us a reason to have two designs of the sawmill so we can, uh, you know, have our cake and eat it too. Now this is where I discovered that Gadot Engine actually comes pre-built with some really cool nodes that make building a railroad extremely simple. Essentially there's a node called CSG Polygon which allows you to paint a profile of a shape and then it will in turn extrude that profile uh, for you. And the cool thing is that the developers of Godot Engine have implemented the ability for the CSG polygon to extrude along a path. So you can use a path node to draw out your entire railroad and then, well, the rails profiles are actually going to extrude themselves all along that path. Now, I found the solution off of another YouTuber. I figured before I'm gonna attempt to make something of my own or God forbid, attempt to build the entire rail system out of like kits or pieces uh, that I would have to manually place myself. I did a little research and I was pleasantly surprised that this is something that's already built into the engine right away. Albeit the solution to it was meant for Godot 4 and I had to do just a little bit of revising in the tool script in order to make the rails uh, work within Godot 3 context. To be honest, most of it was just renamed functions. Like all the actual functions that go into building something like this were already there. I just had to rename a couple of functions to backport them to Godot 3 syntax. With the rail system done, I wanted to knock out some additional props off the list. So I decided to work on a location this time. This was a, a, the early office location um, or some sort of a security checkpoint that the player would have to uh, visit. They would be given the coordinates to this location right in the beginning, early on. So it acts as a, almost like a primer for the player to get into the story. Once again, there's a particular problem with this kind of game, and it actually shares a lot of the problems that a game called Outer Wilds had to deal with. You see, Outer Wilds, just like this game, is basically just big open space, and then the story is scattered across all these planets or all these locations. And the player can literally go anywhere. And the way Outer Wilds decided to do it is that you can technically start your story from within anywhere. You are likely going to, well, visit the moon first and then get your primer there. That's how I got my primer. But um, you can hypothetically go anywhere. And their problem was that 
the story could be told from quite literally any point in time and they needed to make sure that it is cohesive and when the player gets one piece of the story they actually have a way of figuring out where to go next regardless from which point they start now this is again this is a two people slash solo project and um that I, I don't have the kind of resources to try to figure that out so i decided to very simply go for a linear storytelling type and simply prime the player by giving them the first location of uh, the the narrative for free i'll just frame it as a, a note that was left in the the priming the tutorial area where uh the character will say i found a whole bunch of uh, interesting resources here there's like a stockpile but i couldn't get in so maybe you'll have better luck once the player finds their way into this location they will be given all the necessary tools and coordinates to get to their next destination now, these locations are basically chunks of the bunker that have been ripped apart by some sort of a core narrative event, and they're now scattered all over the swamp. Uh, to build out these locations, I basically try to use a lot of the Bezier painting tool, converting it to a mesh, filling it out, and then extruding it. After blocking down the initial room dimensions, I actually decided to give it a 90 degree turn and extrude an additional room through which the player would be able to crawl in using an air vent. And this would not be the same air vent that we made earlier in the uh, auditorium area. This is actually an air vent that the player is capable of pulling off themselves. Now, programming the actual pullable part of the vent is actually super simple because it pretty much ties into the system we've already generated, uh, created by this point, which is a grabbing system. When you can pick up a crate and put a bunch of stuff in it, pick it up and then carry it around. Nothing different about the system. So all I had to do is make the, uh, the vent actually be a rigid body, make it uh, be a part of the group called grabbable group. And after that, that's it. You that's literally the entire process of making something grabbable because I've programmed the system in such a way where all it takes is just making something into a rigid body and making a part of a node group to make it grabbable. I do think that eventually I will add additional features to the vent, like uh, having little rivets or maybe screws that the player has to use a special tool in order to uh, get through. It'll put an interesting new spin onto a mechanic that the player has already discovered. And this is where we get to the particular challenge that I still have to work with, I still have to overcome on each location basis from project to project. I can write out the basic locations where the narrative could be progressed and the player progresses through the game, acquires new key items that lets them move forward, but the locations themselves don't really have a particular puzzle pre-written or pre-conceived uh, ahead of time. A lot of times I'll just say, okay, we need a location for a security checkpoint and that's it. I'll model the security checkpoint, uh, block it out in some rudimentary way, but the obstacle of how to get into the security checkpoint, well, that's a that's a totally different system. And sometimes I grab inspiration, uh, maybe something will come to me on the fly, like this air vent system, it's a fairly, fairly basic uh, feature. Sometimes I might um, actually grab inspiration from a prop that Antoine has made. Like for example, he had, um, uh, a little while ago, he had created a prop of a gas tank, a uh, little gas canister, like a propane canister. And I figured we can definitely use that to blow up a hole and gain entrance to some sort of a location. So the locations themselves in this game are relatively determined outside of flashes of inspiration like with the sawmill, but the means of actually getting inside of them, well, that's usually means for some improvisation. Enough time has passed that uh, I figured I wanted to come back to an earlier prop, which is the computer terminal. There was one particular aspect of the terminal that I found to be annoying, and it's the fact that I, I couldn't get anti-aliasing to run on the viewport, which is used to host the user interface, which means text tends to be kind of blocky and sometimes hard to read, especially if the size of the screen is very small. So I had to scale up the dimensions of the screen simply to make text more legible. I think it's still not enough. I might just have to also increase the dimensions of the text font to make it uh, work. And since I'm on the subject of the office location, I figured I'll just go ahead and spend a little bit of time maybe putting together some office props. Some of these props were improvised and some of them have been on my to-do list for a little while. Uh, a couple of those props are a filing cabinet, a supply cabinet, which is actually like a big cabinet with two swinging doors, which uh, can either be opened or can be locked and the player has to use a pry tool in order to pry it open at the cost of the pry tool. 
Aside from that, the more improvised props I had put together are a table lamp, uh, which I intend fully to make interactable, a desk fan, a small like filing storage, of, not a filing cabinet, but it's a, one of those tabletop plastic uh, filing slots. You put documents into them and they sit in the upright formation. Oh yeah, and I've also put together a quick model of a trash can, and this prop was curious because I once again flipped the entire process on the ass end, and instead of doing a model first, I decided to create the texture of the trash bin first. Technically, this was quite literally painting a, a couple of X's for the mesh in Krita, turning it into a pattern, and then popping into the uh, new document, maybe 1024 by 1024 size or 2K size, uh, filling in a portion of it with the mesh, uh, making a circle, using a, a few texture brushes to add a little bit of rust, a touch of shading, and then take the whole texture, pop it into Blender, and then map it onto a cylinder with slightly wider top than bottom. And that's it. The entire modeling process can change on what kind of prop you're planning on making. Now, because I only had the color map, I had used a little program called Mindtex in order to generate the uh, the quick impromptu normal maps, uh, roughness maps, and really anything else I might need. I'm pretty sure this was a streak of me just kind of taking a break from the more complex stuff and doing a little bit of relaxing 3D modeling. So I put together the, uh, the aforementioned filing uh, amenities. This was a receiving shelf uh, where you put documents in just uh, outside or inside the office. I intend on using these to place important narrative documents and then having them rustle in the breeze of uh, a draft and uh, making them uh, emit a little bit of a noise to indicate to the player that there is a document that they can interact with and pick up and read uh, in this location. Just try to attract their attention this way. Aside from that, I think I managed to squeeze in also uh, one of these singular uh, filing uh, drawers. It's basically just set pieces. Now, yes, I could technically find asset packs that have these sort of office things, but to be honest, I like modeling. You know, it's a, it's a pastime. I like it. Nothing against asset packs. Uh, even I use asset packs occasionally for certain projects or experiments or prototypes, but I like modeling. It's therapeutic. Think of it as a... Uh, Legos for adults, so to speak. Some sort of a more intricate creative uh, outlet. And yeah, I know I'm gonna get people going, Yo, man, we're talking about Legos, not for adults. <laughs> yes, there's absolutely no problem with you playing Legos. And yes, that is exactly the way you sound. As a matter of fact, that assembling Legos is probably the most favorite pastime between me and my brother, because it gives us a valid reason to just hang out. And keep in mind, I'm 30 and he's 26. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that uh, Legos would probably make up his largest expenses on a year-to-year -year basis. <laughs> Damn! Now, of course, taking a note from the Frictional Games book and uh, following the trend that I've already established with the levers, I decided to make the uh, drawers uh, of the desk, the lid of the cabinet, and of course, the filing cabinets themselves to operate in the same fashion where you don't just press E to open and close them, you actually left click to engage and then you move the mouse back and forth to open and uh, uh, close them or slide the drawers in and out. I honestly don't know why more games don't do this. I really enjoy this kind of intricate world interaction because it, it, I think it does a better job of placing you into the world. Now I switched my attention to a different location, uh, which is actually going to be a pretty major central point in the game that the player will have to keep coming back to and unlock new zones of this space, uh, gain new clues, unlock new uh, access to new information, and that would be a comms room. Now Antoine, the 3D modeler, has put together a quick mock-up of the dimensions for the room the, from, I think, some sort of a preliminary sketch uh, that I had sent over uh, when we were brainstorming of what kind of locations we would end up uh, adding. So what I had done is simply open up that project and use the existing base geometry as scaffolding uh, to create the actual level geo. At this point, it's pretty mundane. It's using the Bezier tool to draw some concrete chunks and then turning them into mesh, filling them and extruding them. Just a whole lot of that. And this was the time I started to think that maybe, maybe, I should start putting together some sort of a bunker kit. 
uh, some sort of a set of walls, floors, ceilings, uh, crumbled uh, prefabs, nothing grid based. We're not talking about grid maps here, specifically talking about, well, just chunks that I can uh, put together like uh, maybe 3D printed set pieces. Because this does take a significant amount of time and I think if I spend as much time simply creating some modular walls, um, I, I should be able to knock out these chunk pieces out of the park very quickly. Just improvise all sorts of room locations. And this concept is something that we've had borrowed from the Fallout development uh, videos that have been posted on the GDC YouTube channel. This was on the subject of level design and creating prefabricated modular systems that allows them to very easily and very quickly create new levels without having to necessarily dive bomb into Maya or Blender or any other modeling software uh, where they would just have to start from scratch every time. They were essentially talking about creating a whole bunch of sets of grounds, pavements, roads, dirt, walls, cave systems, or not even cave systems themselves, but uh, cave walls, cave ceilings, cave floors, and then they could just, well, kid bash it, really. That's the term for it. So I'm pretty sure, I think that the comms room is going to be the last location that I handcraft from the beginning and uh, any other bunker locations will just be made using these uh, prefabricated pieces. We'll have to spend some time putting them together. There of course has to be a variety of walls, walls with windows, walls with uh, uh, door frames, wall walls with holes in them, uh, erosion uh, walls, all sorts of stuff. Especially I think uh, I should handle that before I go into the creation of the lab portion of the bunker because that is a pretty hefty chunk of work and I think it'll be better if I uh, just built it out of these module pieces as it will take a fraction of the time of doing it by hand. One of the core components within this level is a projection screen which the player would use to gain some information, maybe a key code, maybe some sort of a password, maybe some context uh, for the unraveling of the whole mystery. So the projector has to project the image onto something and I decided to go with a retractable electronic screen which would be controlled through a terminal. Now in order to make the screen retract and still maintain its image without UV skewing, um, I could have technically used a regular mesh and then simply used uh, what triplanar collisions but then I'd have to map the UVs to somehow follow the screen. So what I decided to do instead is make use of a CSG box. In Godot Engine, you have these CSG boxes that can dynamically resize themselves, um, which isn't the same as scaling. That's a key distinction that will help me with uh, achieving this effect. The fact that they resize instead of scale allows them to maintain their UV coordinates, UV data. So that I think should allow me to create uh, pretty pretty decent uh, projection screen. Of course, aside from the projection screen, there's also the projector itself, which again, I I remember what the uh, the slide projectors or the transparent paper projectors looked like when I was in high school. So I uh, know the general principle, uh, the general work operation, but the actual look of it, I wanted to adjust for something that can fit a reel of slides onto the side of it. The unit would offer a set of controls that are directly in front of it and I try to make sure that the controls are positioned in such a way where if the player looks down onto the buttons the actual projection is still within view because I would find it extremely annoying if I have to keep looking down up down up down up in order to be able to see what's happening and still interact with it. The uh, echoes of the iDLC for Outer Wilds dealt with it by having the player engage the interactable projector, um, which is where the camera controls were relinquished and the camera would point to the projected area and then the left and right buttons would control the slide switching. Of course, immediately after putting in that prop, I'd have to make sure that it can be interacted from within the terminal. And once again, the whole approach is already figured out. All I have to do is attach a script to the projection screen, give it an interact function, and then that's it. Place a terminal on the table. It has an export variable where I can supply any number of interactable objects uh, that will be uh, organized by index because it's an array of nodes uh, or an array of node paths technically. And um, that's it. Within the menu, I just specify this button is of type trigger and it will interact with node index of zero or one or two, however many there may be. At this point, once again, I decided to switch gears and take care of one of the 
really basic mechanics, which is note collection. If there's a note on the ground, note on the table, note on the receiving uh, shelf, the player has to look at it, press a button, and then a note will pop up, and then they can interact with it, read it, and it will be stored into their journal. So there's a couple of things I had to put together. First of all, the player has to have a journal. Uh, I went with kind of a temporary solution where the player has this uh, this set of papers that slides from the side of the screen. I am still on the fence on whether or not that looks good, but um, I'm sure I can maybe come up with something a little bit better. I, I, I'm not too thrilled on the fact that it just occupies the side of the screen, but basically it's just that, what, it's like a list, right? I'd rather make the notes, including the list of what notes are available to be more located to the center of the screen. So maybe I can rearrange the papers to be in the middle uh, and then have them shuffle and then a note just appears on top. Again, back to a little bit of a break, I decided to put together a set piece, which is uh, kind of like a switchboard, uh, some sort of piece of uh, radio equipment, radio machinery, or maybe a communications console. Now, this might be a bit unrelated, but uh, even though some of these props look really cool, I don't think I'm going to be porting them over to Atomicon just because, uh, well... I don't know. I mean, these props are kind of a unique staple of this particular project. I've put enough work into them to uh, to make them sit well with the environment. And I think I would just enjoy making some of these props again and uh, maybe improving upon the system for the second time. So even though I expect there to be a lot of consoles, a lot of equipment uh, in the Atomicon project, I would say that it would be worthwhile to model some new props and maybe play around with the final design and see if I can come up with something different. Maybe even improve on the workflow, who knows? It is possible to get to a point in your career where modeling just becomes so simple that it's not a problem to remodel something from scratch. Now, with that prop done, I decided to go back to the security office that the player uh, encounters fairly early in the game, and uh, I started experimenting more and more with tool scripts. The, uh, the railroad tool script had actually opened my eyes to the entire flexibility of what a tool script can bring, and it's the, the sole fact that you can run GDScript in the editor is absolutely paramount. That's the most powerful thing that you can come up with for a game engine. I remember back when I was working on the Artec Rise project in the Game Maker Studio, I had made some tools, but those tools only ran while I ran the game. So I had to make things like uh, when you're in tool mode, the camera detaches from the player and has to follow the tool. I had to make a saving and loading system that would allow me to actually keep the changes and all the work that I've done while the game was running. One of the tools like that that I put together is a custom shadow designer, which is effectively, uh, it's like the reverse of a lighting system. Instead of placing lights and then enabling shadows on the lights, because, you know, game makers stuck in Stone Age and there's no actual lighting system and there's no actual shadow system, you have to program all of those things yourself every time. And I used to think that that is the norm. Every single game engine will require you to make something like that yourself, but apparently not with Godot. And, and that's really the reason why I chose to stick with Godot for the past five years. So I made a shadow system uh, and a lighting system. The lighting system was fairly straightforward, but the shadow system allowed me to go into some sort of an edit mode that I had to program myself. And then within that edit mode, I would draw uh, polygons uh, of varying uh, degrees of brightness or varying degrees of transparency and essentially draw my own shadows. It would be like a fake shadow kit. Now, it would immediately boost the fidelity of the game, yes, but it would also come at a cost. And the cost is that first I had to make the tool. Second of all, every single level that I make, I now have to also, when I'm done with the base level and uh, placing all the props and geometry, um, placing all the sprites and obstacles and decorations, then I would have to run the game. I would have to uh, engage the tool and I would have to paint the shadows and beams and then make the composition work and then transition the, the gradients of all the shadows manually per light. So it would be just a, a huge, huge mess. And it, it, it didn't really... Um, account for all possible ways that the player can overlap with the geometry. So sometimes the, the body would just stick outside of the shadow, but it sort of worked, kind of. Um, but that was just 
yeah. It was a feat and it was good experience, but it sucked major donkey balls. I would never want to do that again. And you know, lo and behold, I realized that Godot allows you to create literally tool scripts that allow you to execute GD script within the editor. So what I've decided to do here with this door is I tried to make the door um, essentially configurable so that I can choose the direction of the door, uh, the direction which the door opens to be customizable in the editor. In order to indicate the direction of the door, I use a three dimensional arrow that points in the direction of where the door will open. There's also a customizable lock location, which allows you to set is the lock going to be on the one side of the door or is it going to be on the other side of the door so now we essentially have the system where uh, I can have these doors be reusable and placeable all over the different bunker chunks all I have to do is just set some check boxes for is the lock on the left side or on the right side and is the door swings inwards or outwards and that's it I literally never have to worry about doors again in a nutshell tool scripts are freaking awesome now back within the checkpoint office I went back to address the uh, the supply cabinet and it's the fact that it hasn't really been made interactive until this point and of course physical interactions much like in soma much like in amnesia is what i wanted to do for these cabinets so the good news since the system has already been made for a bunch of other props is just literally a matter of assigning a script giving it the appropriate function putting it in a node group and that's it now as i mentioned before the supply cabinet has a particular quirk to it it's one of the few props that can be found locked and can be pried open using a makeshift pry tool a makeshift pry tool can be put together using a pipe a piece of metal rebar and some duct tape it is a single use resource which you can either craft or you can find pre-made ones rarely uh, and i'm also thinking of adding an actual crowbar which has multiple uses to it before it breaks now, knocking off the small fly off the list of tiny little changes I wanted to implement, the flashlight and the flash bang items in your inventory have a particular secondary feature, and it's the fact that you can actually mount them on the wall in order to create traps to protect yourself. Something that could be a relatively common occurrence in this uh, desolate, swampy wasteland is that you can find a location, you walk into the location, and when you're rustling through the papers and figuring some stuff out, you can have an enemy that just walks in on you, and now you're trapped. So the player could protect themselves by um, hanging these flashbangs and flashlights by the entrances pointing outwards in order to protect themselves from getting ambushed. So what I wanted to focus on here is the indicator that allows the player to see where the light is pointing to. I first started with a simple CSG box, but it's it looks kind of ugly. It gets the job done. It does communicate to the player where the light is going to be pointing to, but it doesn't look that great. It's also very hard to see in the dark environment, so I decided to create um, almost like a dotted line or a dashed line that would point and also scroll in the direction of where the light will end up pointing. Basically, it's a little impromptu indicator. Also, on another note, this project was started in Godot 3.0, and since then, Godot 4 has been out for like a good half a year by this point, uh, probably even more, and I don't necessarily think it's necessary to port this o this project over to Godot 4 because, well, that introduces a whole bunch of porting issues, which I have learned to have very intimate experience with, and I absolutely hate it. It is terrible. The porting process is absolute garbage and it's across multiple projects and with some of my students we've gone through the process of porting the project over it is not worth it but i would still like to have nice effects like volumetric fog or volumetric lighting which of course we don't get to have that in Godot 3 unless i have some sort of an extension or some hacky workarounds so you know what i decided to do what old developers from the games of our childhoods used to do and just fake it i placed a, a three-dimensional cone with a gradient acting as a color value and transparency. I made it unshaded, I made it not receive any shadows, and uh, made it glow a little bit, and that's it. it. It doesn't look as good? No. Does it work? I think so. For the limited scope of this game and the relatively stylized aesthetic, I think this will get the job done just fine. Sure, it may look a little glitchy and it may awkwardly clip into certain planes, but you know what? That's fine. I don't consider that to be a big deal. 
I took a break to do some uh, environmental prop modeling. This time I decided to address some of the props that one would find in a communications office, which is, you know, communications equipment. I tried to keep things relatively simple, but also varied. So I created a bunch of these uh, military looking uh, communication radio units. I will admit I used absolutely no references to it. So some of the dials may look like they don't even belong in real world, but um, they look cool. That's all that I really went with. I also figured since this is a communications room, there's probably gonna be some, uh, what is it, privacy desks uh, that you would find uh, where workers have some shielding from uh, their left side and right side. So people cannot eavesdrop and they're working on some classified documents. I gotta say of all the props that I've made, this one gave me a, the most pain in the assery just simply because i decided to go with all the wrong routes trying to build this whole thing out of a single mesh and then the beveling wouldn't behave because it's made out of a single mesh it's you know uh, just live and learn i guess the rest of this particular session was spent uh i think crop dusting some little leftover tidbits here and there like for example creating a collision shape array for this uh communications console the switchboard i did want to just generate a triplanar collision shape because i think that with all of the levers all of the wires and all of the pipes that would just make for way too complex of a collision shape completely unnecessarily for this particular case I took the time to embed some staircases into the floors of the communications office. I realized I went a little bit too liberal with uh, the crumbling effect because technically the floor in the communications office outside of the very bottom floor is technically wood. So it would make sense for it to be so crumbly. So I had to spend a bunch of time straightening my own mess. I also gone back to the uh, some of the office props, which would be the fan and the light source, and I made sure that those props are actually interactable, and when they are on, they consume power, because that is something that the player will sometimes have to take advantage of, or locate some of the props that are consuming all the power and disable them, so that uh, whatever they're actually trying to use can stay on for longer. Since I was on the subject of the communications office, I decided to put together a very small, very lightweight kit for railings. Uh, something that just has a straight edge, a 90 degree turn, a short edge, and then some sort of a terminating shape. And it was while making this particular kit that I started seeing the benefits of doing even modeling in a very modular approach uh, for a game like this. Because once I had these railings in place, I can use them in other places in the game. I mean, it sounds like a dumb, obvious thing to realize, but when you have to handle things like programming, modeling, texturing, music, sound, narrative, script writing, voice recording, mixing and mastering, you know, these simple things tend to slip your mind. But, uh, you know, the final effect looks pretty damn awesome, I would say. Again, taking a break uh, from doing some more complex stuff, doing a little bit more modeling, I uh, decided to put together an alternate version to an office lamp, which is honestly, it's probably the sort of lamp that you have seen the most whenever you're doing concept art research for games. It's the, the, the half cone, green tinted um, lamp for a table that you, you use a little pullable string to turn on. I also imported the radio piece of radio equipment that I made earlier and simply just rearranged some of the components to create alternate versions of the same prop. I believe the other two variations of this are quite literally just same components that I either extruded or stretched or resized and rearranged in space. Now, this is where I started thinking, uh, what is this whole place gonna look like? And I have a particular prototype, which is a Portal 2's desolate laboratories that you witness earlier in the beginning of the game uh it's just all overgrown this this soil everywhere mold there's vines and foliage growing all over the place and you know in places where it's not supposed to be so i decided to give foliage making a try uh now again just like with the trash can i went about this in a completely backwards manner where i went to Krita, i have hand painted a texture for a single leaf a larger and a smaller one and then 
I imported it into Blender, mapped it onto a flat plane, I cut out the leaf, uh, gave it a little bit of geometry, retopologized it, and that's it, just morphed everything to make it look like a big, sprawling piece of greenery sticking out uh, at the ground. Now, unexpectedly, it actually came out, at least in my opinion, pretty damn good. So I decided since I was on a roll, I would create another piece of uh, geometry, uh, which would be a fern. As a matter of fact, now that I look at it, I think I might use the fern as the larger prop and then the, the single leaf of foliage, a single leaf piece of uh, greenery is actually going to be much smaller. Uh, I would probably distribute those along the corners and the edges, while the fern is going to be the more dominant uh, piece of foliage within uh, any bunker structure. Now, I will chuck this particular point completely to experience, but I have wasted far, far too much time attempting to create some sort of an automated brush in the Critter Brush Engine to basically paint the, the, the fern leaves in a randomized, although slightly predictable manner to make it kind of decrease over time. But I honestly think that uh, the the brush engine in Krita was not programmed by something who knows what we want. Um, it it seems more like an artist's rendition of what they think a, a brush engine should look like rather than a programmer's one. And yes, that's a very, you know, very harsh way to put it, and I'm sure that somebody will take offense, but it's just the reality. Where is randomness? Where is randomness that can be used as a source? Right? You can't even like randomly rotate the brush. You have to either use pressure or time. And if you use time, you can somehow s sort of simulate the sense of randomness, but you have to draw it out in a curve. And it that's not really random. And the thing is that it takes for such a long time that iteration is impossible. So, you know, it, it's waste of time, but good learning experience because I'll know not to go this route next time. It was actually uh, like a tenth of the time when I would just duplicate the layer with a fern leaf and just propagate it, move it, and rotate it manually. I also tried to use the Blender's particle system uh, in hair mode in order to simulate the same effect, which was yet another waste of time, but will, you know, again, learning experience. You have to fail to know how to not to do it. Now, at this point, since I was already on the... Uh, general subject of the communications room, there's a particular mechanic that is pretty prominent throughout this entire game, which is the player locating their next destination to go to. You see, by the story design, the bunker had equipped the major locations with a radio beacon, why you will find out through playing the game through the story but there's a device that the player can use which they can select the channel the major frequency and the lower frequency in order to hone in on a particular beacon hear where it's coming from figure out its direction and then go there and this is how i'm solving the problem of the entire bunker being spread out all over the map the player not knowing where they are or where to go but still having a sense of direction within the communications office there's a series of tools that the player will be able to interact with in order to to gather some information, uh, like for example, what frequencies to get, um, figure out where the rooms are, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. As I said, it's a central location. So I had to design this radio locator, this beacon locator. It's a handheld device that the player can interact with and then locate wherever they're supposed to go. Now, I don't usually do sketches for some of these props. I usually have a pretty good idea of uh, some sort of general look or general aesthetic for a prop. Uh, I did plot down just a couple of quick sketch ideas and uh, just went straight into modeling to see if I can come up with the rest. I gotta say, I did like the way this prop turned out. It To me, it looked really interesting. Antenna was kind of a pain in the ass. I really didn't know what I was going to go for. But um, the ultimate idea was to let the player interact with this prop uh, intricately. So it's not just take it out and that's it, follow along. I wanted the player to have more hands-on experience interacting with the dials. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it was around this point in time where my hard drive decided to eat shit and die, taking all of my game projects with it. Now, fret not, I was a big boy. I actually implemented uh, Git repositories for all the mainline projects. So Child of Ether is safe. Artek Rise is safe. Dread Tail is safe. Atomicon is safe, even though I'm planning on creating a new project and just importing some of the models in. The most mainline projects that I work on, they are safe. But 
not everything was backed up. Mainly the historical records of all my efforts since about 2012 are basically gone. Now, in a lot of those cases, anything from those previous years, I likely would not have come back to. Anything that was important, that I deemed important, uh, is backed up. So I can, I can work with that at least. In this case, GitHub had actually come through marvelously. And the reason the hard drive died is because it was just really, really old. I used a program called Crystal Disk in order to check the statistics of the hard drive. And uh, apparently, on average, according to Google, uh, a mechanical drive's lifespan lasts for about 40,000 hours. Mine was at 59,000 hours. So, yeah, it was it, it, it was time. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, grandpa had to be put to sleep. I am actually thinking of uh, maybe digging up some of the old computers I had, uh, maybe my old development machines, and then just stripping out the core parts of them, and then turning them to some sort of a impromptu NAS solution. Perhaps something that I can host my own local repository server on, so that besides GitHub, I also have something of my own. For the Dreadtail, the only thing that I've lost is the fern. Uh, the large leaf plant was already backed up by that point, but I lost the fern and I lost the radio locator, which I was a little bit more pissed off about losing that, but you know what? The one that I made after actually looked even better. Which honestly begs the question, how many of the props that I've made so far would look better if I were to just remake them from scratch? The problem is that I'm not going to remake a lot of these props because of the amount of time it costs to, well, make them from scratch again. Like, a prop really has to look like absolute ass for me to deem it unusable. But in this case, I'm kind of glad that the hard drive died because the second version of the, uh, the radio beacon actually looks, I would say, even better. At least I was actually able to figure out what to do for the antenna. Uh, I decided to go with a widened dish-like thing at the very tip of the unit and um, some sort of a curved grill on the left side of the radio, which honestly, it just gives it like, it, it gives it um, cheap complexity, especially when you use like flat surfaces with a lot of holes in them. That just gives it complexity at no extra cost. It's like one of those tutorials that uh, gives you some hints on how to create complex, busy cityscapes uh, for your comics, uh, and in reality it's just like a couple of brush strokes or using a special type of white brush and just loosely uh, putting streaks in the background and then simulating lights by just like splashing droplets of white, uh, white ink on it, something like that, right? So, yeah, it worked out. I'm still pissed though, but, you know, it worked out. The last thing I've done on this little radio beacon was uh, program it to have the aforementioned level of interaction. Um, now, this was kind of a pain in the butt to figure out because for some reason, there were certain cases when my mouse would interact with um, uh, a dial and another case when it wouldn't. And I couldn't figure out why until I turned on visible collision shapes in the debugger panel. And I realized that when I look down, the player interaction raycast ended up colliding with the player fat ass collision shape and it was just blocking the ability to interact with anything at that point um in that case uh technically it was a uh, mouse detection because the mouse was colliding with the collision shape long before it could actually collide with these dials now i haven't programmed the actual radio beacon detection yet that should be fairly trivial now that these dials uh, are in place I am looking forward to though, because I know it's going to be a really cool mechanic. Also, I have found out that apparently I'm not the only person who likes to uh, put in the time to create intricate models, but then completely skip over texturing and just putting some slapped generic colored material on it uh, instead of putting it in substance and hand texturing and everything. Good to know that I'm not the only lazy ass out there. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy texturing, but Texturing takes, I would say, more time than modeling. And uh, for the amount of props that I have created here, I probably would not have made as much progress as you see me make in, well, this report, uh, if I had to texture everything. I'll leave texturing for the later stages. Now, on the final stretch, one of the 
key props that the player finds within the comms room is the blackboard. And the blackboard essentially contains some encoded information which the player needs to progress forward. And the most important thing is that that information is going to be randomized. Yes, this is an idea that I'm going to be totally borrowing from a game called Deathloop. Deathloop, I found to be um, really interesting. And the idea I'm borrowing is both ingenious and annoying as shit. And the feature I'm talking about is the fact that every single pin code, pin number, safe code is randomized every time you start a new game. I don't know why, but for some reason, when I was playing Deathloop, whenever I would come across some sort of a, an interesting door and I'd be like, oh man, I want to find out what's behind this door. The first instinct was like, man, why can't you just let me in? Like, why do you got to tease me like this? This sucks. And I was just like, well, okay, well, you know, don't mind if I just open a little, uh, little guide here and take a look at uh, how to open this door with the pin number is. And then I, I'm reading one guide and it's like, where the hell is the pin number? Um, I don't see any numbers. What the hell? Like close them, go to the different website, different, different guide. Uh, okay, let's see if this one works. Um, what the hell? There's no numbers here either. And then it wasn't until I was on the fifth guide that I decided to actually read the guide from the beginning. And then within the first few sentences, it says all the codes are randomized. Son of a... Anyway, so it's annoying, yes, but it's also an interesting way of making sure that the game has replay value so that every time you play it, you can just memorize all of the codes and uh, just, you know, straight through the game uh, immediately. So in Dread Tale, in the beginning of the game, the uh, the whole project is going to randomly generate a series of um, codes. And the player has to go to the comms room, look at the blackboard, make a note of the codes, and then use them on the particular machine, which then gives them a coordinate or a, a radio beacon frequency that they punch into the radio machine, and then they can find where they're going. Okay, Jesus Christ, that's it. That's all the updates that I have for the Dread Tale. My God, am I going to learn ever that I shouldn't wait this long before doing an update. I should do them on like a monthly basis so that the updates are shorter, they're more concentrated, but at least they're not gonna take like a three hours to explain. You know what? It's already two and two hours and 20 minutes. I'm not even going to bother reporting on the last game because this is just way too goddamn long. The last game is Artek Rise. I only made a lot of narrative stuff and voice recordings there. Oh God. Um, so yeah, not a whole lot of gameplay, a, a whole lot of shenanigans and We'll just leave it at that. You know what? Dread Tale, Child of Ether, these are the major contenders. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm doing with Artek Rice is just making levels, and then I, I, I doubt there's any real interest in watching uh, something mundane take place there. So when something interesting comes up, I'll report on it. Oh yeah, I think the most interesting thing that happened there is that I ported the project over to Godot 4, and it was a pain in the ass. So, you know, that's, that's, that's all I gotta report on it. Anyways, top most important thing, buy a Gadot hat, okay? I have a bet with my father that I'm gonna make at least $1,000 before Christmas, all right? Before Christmas or New Year. And if if I win, he owns me a nice bottle of some sort of a drink. And if I if if, if he wins, then I gotta do the same thing for him. I need to make like maybe what, 10 sales, 15 sales for these Gadot hats? Do it, help me. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Link in the description.